We are recording. Hey. So we're good to go. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you all for your attendance during the holiday season, our December meeting. And uh, first and foremost, the review and approval of the December 10th, 2020 business meeting agenda. I'll need a motion. Raymond, before we uh, move with the agenda, um, the discussion item on the oyster presentation is going to have to be moved to the January meeting. Uh, Jeff Kennedy of our shellfish program was double booked this morning. So we're going to have to strike 5C from the agenda. Okay. Did everybody understand Jared? Raise your hand if you didn't. Okay, moving forward, I guess, uh, has anybody else got a change that they would like to make on this agenda? Any other commission member? I'm not seeing any hands raised. No hands raised. I'll need a motion to accept, to approve. Raise your hand if you'd like to make the motion. Motion to approve. Bill, thank you. That's Bill Doyle, motion to approve. Second. Mike Pierdnock with a second. Thank you. And uh, all those in favor, aye. We can Unan do unanimous. Unanimous consent? Yes. Not seeing any objections. Thank you. Review and approval of the October 29th draft business meeting minutes. Has anybody got corrections or have they got anything to ad lib? Please speak. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Ray. We can move to a motion to accept. Khalil here, move to accept. Khalil Bogdan with a motion to accept, looking for a second. Tim Brady, uh, second. And if there's no opposition. If you have no. opposition to adopting the October 29 minutes, raise your hand. Not seeing any hands raised, Ray. We can move to comments. We can move to comments, thank you. Uh, once again, I want to thank commission members for attending. I mean, this is something new to me. I've been on the commission for years and I'm overwhelmed by the sincerity and the attendance record of this present day commission. And uh, I'm just happy about it. I want to wish you all right now out of the gate, a happy holiday season, be safe, be healthy. I'm going to turn it over to the commissioner, Ron Amidon of Fish and Game. Ron. Good morning, Chairman Kane, and uh, thank you, and thank you to all the commissioners uh, for participating here today. Um, I'd like to uh, point out that I got a a call um, a week ago from Director Fred Lasky at the MWRA that his crews uh, had finally finished their portion of the fishing pier work that we did over on Deer Island. Uh, it consisted mostly of some uh, additional lighting and some security camera work. So he was very pleased uh, to tell me that we are now 100% complete. He uh, issued his apologies for lagging behind uh, the work that we did through our own folks. Both uh, Ross Kessler and, and our Doug Cameron uh, did a heck of a job of getting that done. It was a very difficult partnership. Um, and we're, we're still working through some of the red tape and we probably will be. We have, uh, I know Dan and his crew have, have worked hard at getting uh, some video footage down there and we hope to have a, a grand opening ceremony sometime when weather permits in the spring. Um, within the last few weeks, I also got a chance to get out with our folks at the Division of Ecological Restoration and look at a dam removal uh, on the uh, North South River watershed from called the Peterson Dam in Hanover, uh, and also uh, a dam removal and some culvert removals and two uh, cranberry bog restorations uh, on the Childs River in Falmouth. Both of those uh, both of those projects should hopefully create uh, some additional fish passage for our diadromous fish. I was pretty excited about that. Some really nice work. And then uh, 
Just yesterday, the Department of Fish and Game held its Performance Recognitions Awards Ceremony. And I am very pleased to announce that the DMF Shellfish team uh, received an award for their uh, outstanding work that they, they actually do day in and day out, uh, above and beyond the, the call of duty, as it seems, with the workload that those folks have and the partnerships that they're involved with. But they also continue to do that all the way through uh, this whole complication of the COVID-19 uh, debacle. And they uh, haven't missed a beat. And uh, kudos to them uh, for winning that award. And it was extremely well deserved. Also in yesterday's awards, the uh, DMF CARES Act team, which was chaired by uh, Dan and Kevin, um, they uh, also received an award for their outstanding efforts at getting the CARES Act money out to all of our fishermen through the Marine Fisheries Program. And not only did they accomplish that task, but they were the first ones in the entire nation to get that project brought to completion where all monies have now been issued. Uh, that's, that's quite the, uh, the accomplishment, considering there were so many other folks throughout the country doing the same thing. And they were so successful at it that now um, the national organizations are looking at utilizing it as um, kind of a, a framework, if you will, for future uh, needs. So that's, that's pretty special. And because that is so special, they have also taken that award and been turned up to the governor's office and they are now in line for the Manuel Carballo Award, which is an even more difficult achievement for excellence in public service. So good luck to them uh, in that competition and I am sure they will be very successful. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, I would like to uh, see if we could give a few moments to Deputy Commissioner Mary Lee King. She has a few words to say to us today. Mary Lee, are you on? We're on. I'm not seeing her in the list of attendees or in the panelists. I've huh? texted her to see, but I, I have not heard back. Maybe she's having some computer issues, but I know she did have a few words for us today. I will uh, text her and see if, what her availability is. Other than that, uh, I want to thank uh, the Commission and Chairman Kane for allowing me to have some time. Thank you, Commissioner Ron, uh, and kudos, uh, a loud applaud for Kevin and Dan uh, to follow up with the awards they've received. And I know it was That's he sharing his screen. Everybody, everybody mm -hmm. on Dan's staff worked you can't diligently, see it. and I'm glad they are reaping the awards. So I will move along to the director himself. Dan? This is what they're showing you right now. That's okay. good. Let me. Oh, Thank you, Ray. So we have somebody uh, talking in the background, Dan. They're not muting themselves. Yeah. It looks like we have uh, Mary Lee King here. Do we want to go to her comments yes. first? Mary yeah. Lee King, Deputy Commissioner, please. Mm -hmm. Mary Lee, you're muted. We're just trying to get her set up. She's on her phone right now. I can mute her. Okay. You want, Ray, would you like me to, to speak and Mary Lee can come in after? Yes, by all means. Okay. All right. I'll do that. Thank you. All right. Um, Thanks, Ron, for those those kind words uh, on, on the CARES Act. Uh, since we last met, we did cut the last of the checks, and we were were pretty uh, pretty pleased with the outcome. I, I can't uh, say enough about the the talented team that I oversee, um, and and the the foundation of a lot of what we did uh, was really about uh, data uh, and data analysts, uh, Anna Webb, Eric Druskett. Um, they were able to use all of the landings uh, data that we have, all of the fishermen's reports, uh, uh, access uh, VTR data from the federal government. So we really did uh, our best to uh, scale these payments uh, in, a, in a way that, that was fair and, and was uh, sort of uh, 
gave gave more to the to the larger operations who suffered uh, deeper losses. Um, that and you know part of this is really Paul Diodati's legacy when he went forward and, and he mandated 100% trip level reporting for all fishermen back about uh, 10 years ago. And really, this is the fruit of. Um, of, of, of that. And uh, so anyway, so thank you to the team and, and thank you, Ron, for, for those kind words. Um, the MSI task force, that's the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative uh, Task Force. We, we met last Friday for the first time in almost 20 months. If, for those uh, on the commission who may not be familiar with it, this was a, a, a federal grant that was received by a, a group of folks, including um, us in a in a semi-involved way, but it was designed to come up with a um, shellfish strategic plan for Massachusetts, similar to what has been done in some other states, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, some of the West Coast, uh, Oregon, California, Washington, all did one as well. And uh, it's been a little bit rocky. Um, the uh, the level of, of, um, of trust among some of the shellfish stakeholders uh, is sometimes be a little thin. Um, but we are plowing forward with this. Uh, in the last meeting, I mentioned the two reports. There's an assessment committee report and a scoping committee report. Uh, I know they're long, but I would, uh, anybody who's interested in shellfish, I'd really recommend you open those documents, especially the, the assessment report for those who don't quite understand, um, you know, all that, that goes into managing shellfish at the state and municipal level with all the federal oversight that we deal with. So it's really a great document. So um, anyway, we met for the first time uh, in a long time, and now we've got a strategic planning committee. Next meeting is Monday, and we are going to get this done uh, before the before March, because that's we got a no cost grant extension, uh, and uh, and we are going to bring this over the finish line. It's one of my priorities. We met with the Mass Conch Association last month. This is a new association of members uh, and they are seeking to delay future gauge increases. They're unhappy with the results of our previous maturity study. They've contracted a university researcher to examine samples to challenge our size and maturity results. Uh, we have yet to see those results come back, but we said we'd certainly be willing to take a look what they came up with. Um, Ron just mentioned the Deer Island Pier is completed and uh, we're really thrilled with that. That took about a year and three quarters uh, it's a beautiful structure and I'm looking forward to that spring event. Uh, and we will be uh, most likely by the new year, um, you know, there'll be a, a video on our social media, uh, you know, channels or social media uh, uh, platforms to uh, sort of tout not only the peer, but the program, you know, the, trying to convince anglers about where the money goes. Obviously it's, uh, it's a dedicated fund. Two of our commission members, Khalil, who's chair, and Mike Pierdenak, who serves on that. Uh, that's a five member panel that, that uh, oversees our, our programs and our spending. And uh, having the, the oversight of members of the public definitely creates credibility uh, and trust for this program. And so we, we wanna further explain that um, with this video and, and highlight the new peer. The uh, striped bass commercial uh, fishery committee, of, a subcommittee of this commission is going to meet uh, Monday, December 21st with their first meeting. Uh, we'd like to look at some proposals for this upcoming year, 2021, as well as some longer term, uh, uh, you know, plans for uh, maybe how to manage this fishery uh, in the longer term. Uh, things that we can do for next year would be minor tweaks such as, you know, Days, the days open, for example, are, is kind of low-hanging fruit uh, for me. Um, we need to find a way to um, kind of uh, untether this uh, the, this fishery a little bit to, to allow it to take more of its allocated quota. Um, and so that's I'm interested in participating with the subcommittee to uh, have a, a conversation about that. And then the last thing I want to mention is we are extending, or we did extend as of last night, the 2020 commercial permits through the first month of 2021. This reduces the stress on everybody to get their permits renewed by New Year's. Um, we were doing this, um, it's, it's not routine, um, but it, it does happen uh, depending on the workload of, of how quickly we can turn around applications. Uh, we do have staff working in Boston now. Some of them, um, you know, they're, they're, 
in isolated uh, locations. The Boston office is, is very, very, very lightly staffed. Uh, the only people that we have in there on, our, on a regular basis are those uh, opening the mail uh, where there's uh, renewal, permit renewals, and of course, checks. You know, we, we aren't comfortable having people telework or work at home if it means taking uh, checks or money orders or, or cash home. So uh, that work has to be done in the office. So anyway, uh, we've sent out a notice to all of our commercial permit holders. We're putting it out on our social media as well. Uh, so uh, fishermen are going to have uh, another month uh, to renew that permit. So Ray, that's uh, all I have. I'll take any questions from the commission. Questions for Director McKiernan. Please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any questions, Ray. Okay, uh, let's move back up to C. Uh, is Deputy Commissioner Mary Lee King on? Um, I, I just morning. wanted to. Good morning. Good morning. Um, sorry, my iPad wasn't working, so um, I'm doing it on the phone. I just wanted to announce that after over 40 years in state government, I am retiring at the end of the year. And that's, that's really my announcement. Well, congratulations, Mary Lee King. 40 years of public service is a long time. God bless it, you. It certainly is. <laughs> Have you got anything else you want to mention? No, that was really it. Just I wanted to let the MFAC members know that I am retiring. Well, I, I wish you Godspeed. I wish you good health. Thank you. Has anybody, any other commission member have anything to say to Mary Lee King, please? I, I do, Khalil Bogdan here. I want to congratulate you, Mary Lee, for, for making that decision. I know it's like to make a decision to retire from a profession. It's not easy, uh, but yet it's another chapter in your life. You're gonna turn another page. You're gonna turn another corner as all the expressions go <clears throat> and you're gonna move <laughs> on and enjoy your retirement. Uh, 40 years is quite an achievement. There's a lot of knowledge, a lot of background, a lot of history that's tied up in your mind. <clears throat> and I imagine, I imagine uh, you have a lot of stories to, to tell and can, to talk about. <laughs> with all the different politicians. And I just want to congratulate you in the short period of time that I've known you. <clears throat> I've, I've come to respect you for who you are and, and I want to thank you for everything you've done. Thank you very much, Khalil. It, it, it will be fun to spend time. I have four grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to spending a lot more time with them. Mike Piernock. Uh uh, thank you. I'll, I'll second what Khalil said. And, and Mary Lee, uh, thank you for your years of service. Uh, um, I, I, I'm sure you're not going to miss the phone calls uh, at 11 o'clock at night, three, four in the morning and so on. So the best to you, uh, to you and your family and, and, you know, kiss and hug those grandchildren and enjoy the holidays. Thanks. Thank you once again for your service. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Bill Doyle. Mary Lee, thank you so much for all your uh, help and guidance over the years. And I wish you the very best to enjoy your retirement. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Moran. Mary Lee, it was a pleasure knowing you and working with you. I know two of your grandchildren and they're great kids. Yes, they are. You, uh, Nothing but a happy retirement. Thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciate it. And I know you do see them in the summer. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Mary Lee. It's, uh, it's Tim Brady. I'm sorry if I stepped on anyone, but um, have a, um, a great retirement. I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you're able to enjoy those, those grandchildren. Um, we were lucky enough to uh, welcome our first grandchild this spring. So, um, and we're loving it, but um, really appreciate all the work that you've done with us, guiding us, and um, um, it's it's been a 
it's I think it's a it has been a big um, help to me learning uh, learning the process. This is the first um, state commission I've ever served on, and I, we appreciate so much having someone who's got the um, who um, always had our backs on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the comment. Dan. Yeah, congratulations, Mary Lee. Um, we really wish you well. Um, I, I don't know if the whole commission knows all about the entire uh, career history that you've enjoyed, but you went from being chief of staff for Paul Salucci to then chief of staff for Governor Weld. Um, and I'm just wondering, as you uh, worked on probably a wide array of issues across state government, if there's anything that that in the marine fisheries realm that kind of re sticks stuck with you while you were in that executive branch role, uh, almost, you know, so close to the to the seat of power. If there's anything that uh, any story you'd want to tell about uh, uh, something marine fisheries related, like any anything that because we don't all, always see, um, you know, what happens at the governor's office level about some of these issues, or even anything on the environmental or, or fishing game side. Do you have any memories? Yeah. Um, yes, actually. Um, the one thing that I really worked on was establishing the um, Breck Fishing Fund, where the feds were going to charge us a much higher amount, but they were then going to take all the money. So we were able to work um, through the details and it was passed, the only state, it was passed unanimously in both the House and the Senate and signed by the governor. So that's one, I think unfortunately when I was in the, both Lieutenant Governor and the governor's office, the most difficult part was literally going from one meeting to the next, to the next, to the next, and trying to keep it all straight. Um, but it it was a it's been a a very good journey, if you will. Um, and I appreciate the question. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any further questions or hands raised. Okay, thank you all for your comments. Mary Lee King, thank you, Mary Lee. And thank I'll you. Chat with you over the holidays. Sounds very good. Thank you very much. Moving on to law enforcement. Who's <clears throat> on today? Lieutenant Bass, Major Moran, Colonel Moran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, this is a uh, Lieutenant Bass. I think. Uh, I think I'll grab this, but first up before Mary Lee leaves, that's a uh, congratulations. Um, before, you know, 40 years seems like a unimaginable time, but as I approach half of that, uh, it does go quick. So hopefully I have a, a lot of fond memories I do uh, working with you. So um, with that, congratulations, but um, with that, I'll be brief. Uh, there's uh, we don't have too much to report. We do have uh, three of our new officers currently, uh, I think next week are gonna be uh, finally assigned to their districts and out on their own. Another two still in training and uh, still in the hiring process for several more. Uh, our work in a couple of cases, um, kind of more on the federal side, but um, you know, a lot of state overlap, but uh, as well as a, a fairly a decent, looks like uh, some lobster violations and whatnot uh, up on the North shore as of yesterday, but that's uh, kind of still very fresh and ongoing. But um, with that, we did have, uh, I think, a pretty productive uh, law enforcement subcommittee meeting, but that is on the agenda and I'll wait till that comes up. But uh, with that, I have nothing else. If there's any questions. Questions for Lieutenant Bass. Mr. Chair, really quick. By all means. Uh, that operation last night, um, we've been working on it for a while. It involved six, six different lobster vessels and a, and a wholesale dealer. Um, last night it came together for us, resulting in um, hundreds of violations, including shorts, mutilated, oversized, and V-notch lobsters. Like the lieutenant said, it's still fresh. We're still working on it, but it looks to be like a major case. I'll, I'll, I'll compliment you and your staff. Pat, uh, I have a question. 
So we've got some new agents, you know, boots on the ground coming into the field. So they were hired, what, over a year ago? Because I know the training is nine months or a year. Have we got new recruits coming in, you know, starting from day one? Is that still an ongoing process so we can build this force up? Yep, we're in the process right now of, of doing the final interviews for seven, seven more uh, candidates, hoping to get them in the academy, I think in March. So that'll be seven more officers. We have three officers that are finishing their FTO training um, December 19th. Uh, we'll have one officer up um, in the Gloucester area, one down in the New Bedford area. Um, two officers after that that are just starting FTO training, but both of them are going uh, to inland positions. Yes, well, I want to thank. No, so, no, listen, we we appreciate what the council does for us. Those letters that you write help. And um, you can see it. So we've got 11 people in the mix right now. Yeah, I had somebody from the public, Pat, come up to me the other day and say, do you realize that this particular officer starts at eight in the morning? I said, do you realize how short staffed? I mean, we need more boots on the ground. Uh, they're human like the rest of us. They work an eight hour day. But if we're going to sit here and write regulations and look for enforcement, we need boots on the ground. So I, I can guarantee you none of us work an eight hour day. OK, I'll be glad to let the public know that. But, you know, that's that's I'm just trying to convey to the public that we need more boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you fellas cover from the western part of the state all the way to the ocean. So. You have a big area to cover and we need boots on the grounds for enforcement. So every department, as we write regulations, we can have enforcement. Thank you very much. And again, we thank you for your support. Anytime, Pat. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing Bill Amaru with a comment for law enforcement. Bill, you recognized? Please, Bill, by all means. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I, my question has to do with uh, situation up in Provincetown in Truro on the beach. You may or may not know about this officer. Uh, recently, we had a very strong breeze of wind that blew up a number of bay scallops onto the beach, which it usually does this time of year from the shoal waters there in Cape Cod Bay. And uh, from what I understand, after talking to several uh, residents who, who uh, found me on the dock up in Provincetown, this year they were not allowed to, to collect the scallops. They said that they were state environmental officers on the beach and they were not allowed to pick up the scallops and take them home for human consumption like they normally do. Do you know anything about that? What the reason might have been for not being able to pick them up? I do not. Uh, likewise, I do not, but I can, uh, I'll check the call log now and, uh, and look into it and I can get back to you. That would be great because there'll be more coming up as the, we have our breezes during the winter and that area is usually pretty, uh, heavily populated. That's the area on Cape Cod Bay uh, between the province town and Truro. Yep. Uh, yep. There. I'm, okay. I'm Thank you very much. Yep. But I, I know in my town, um, when that happens, and it has happened in the past, that the shellfish constable would make sure that anybody picking stuff off up off the beach was permitted or had a, a town license. So I don't know if that has something to do with it. Yeah, these, these are local people who did have their licenses. There's no commercial fishery in that in those two towns for shellfish. So um, it would have been residential license holders. But okay, yeah, yeah. you could, you could take a look. Maybe, maybe there'll be something in a log that'll show. Lieutenant Bass will check into it. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Lieutenant Bass, for your updates. Moving on to action items, review open meeting law complaint and approval of written response. Jared, are you going to take this? Mr. Chair, I can take this for the commission. Um, bear with me for a moment. I have a couple slides that I'd like to share to kind of walk through this. Okay. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. 
Okay, so um, we received an open meeting law complaint on November 3rd, 2020, regarding the um, September 24th, 2020 MFAC business meeting. Um, I had four on your behalf, Mr. Chair, I forwarded that complaint along to all the commission members on November 3rd. The complaint alleges that DMF employee Jeff Kennedy violated the open meeting law on September 24th, 2020. Uh, because the meeting was not recorded in full, an incomplete recording was posted to DMF's YouTube channel and the meeting summary published on the DMF website or the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission webpage on the DMF website was not sufficient to understand conversations that occurred regarding the mass shellfish initiative. As a remedy, the complainant seeks a full recording of the September 24th MFAC business meeting. The open meeting law provides the public body with 14 calendar days to respond to a complaint on your behalf. Um, I appeal to the Attorney General's office on November 4th, 2020 um, to extend the complaint response deadline to Monday, December 14th, 2020 to allow the commission to review the complaint at this December 10th meeting. Uh, you should have all received um, a draft response to this complaint, as well as the complaint itself. Um, so at the end of this presentation, we can have a discussion. And Mr. Chair, I'd be looking for the commission to vote up a draft letter or task me to amending a draft letter to be, um, to be sent to the Attorney General's office and the complainant um, by Monday, December 12th or December 14th, rather. Thank you, so, Jeff. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay. Um, so the open meeting law requires that a public body like the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission publish meeting notices that contain the meeting date, time, place of meeting, and sufficiently describe the topics that the chair anticipates to be discussed. These notices have to be published on the website of record which is the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission's webpage on the DMF website and needs to be filed with the Secretary of State. Both must occur 48 hours prior to the meeting. The open meeting law also requires that the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission provide accurate meeting minutes that include a list of all public body members absent or present, a summary of each discussion had, and the exhibits used at the meeting. Um, under the open meeting law, remote meetings are typically not allowed. However, Governor Baker has signed an executive order suspending certain privileges of the open meeting law during this pandemic to allow for remote meetings of public bodies. Uh, the executive order allows for these remote meetings provided the public is, is given an adequate alternative means of attending the meeting. Um, so, our compliance with the open meeting law for that September 24th meeting. The business meeting was conducted in accordance with the open meeting law. Um, the agenda was a published establishing meeting time, date and topics to be discussed. Uh, it was filed with the Secretary of State and published on the website of record on September 18th, 2020, meeting that 48 hour requirement. Uh, additionally, the draft business meeting minutes uh, provided a list of members, public and pre uh, present and absent, summarized all topics of discussion and provided a list of materials and exhibits used during that meeting. Those draft meeting minutes were made publicly available on October 23rd, 2020. They were approved by the commission at their October 29th business meeting and were published on the website of record and made publicly available on October 30th, 2020. Additionally, that, <clears throat> September 24th, 2020 meeting was held via Zoom. Zoom provides real-time audio and video teleconferencing access to the public. Uh, public access was not interrupted during the September 24th meeting, thereby complying with Governor Baker's executive order. Our suggested response to this, the open meeting law complaint, the complaint is erroneous. The open meeting law was not violated. The open meeting law does not require that a public body meetings be recorded. The AG's office has determined or not having complete recordings is not a violation of the open meeting law. There are three complaints that set precedent dealing with this. Uh, DMF 
posted video recordings of the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission meeting to the YouTube channel, and it does that um, in going beyond open meeting law requirements to enhance the transparency of this public body. DMF additionally provides a truncated meeting summary in addition to its meeting minutes that gives a very high level review of what occurred at that meeting. This summary is again, in addition to the required minutes that are provided, and it goes beyond the requirements of the open meeting law to inform the public and enhance transparency. Um, the sought remedy, which is a full recording of that September 24th, 2020 business meeting, cannot be accommodated. The meeting was recorded via Zoom. Um, the meeting was invertedly paused following a break. A portion of that meeting dealing with agenda item 5A, shellfish updates was not recorded. A full meeting recording does not exist and is not in the possession of the Division of Marine Fisheries or the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission. So the follow up here would be that the complaint is erroneous and the remedy cannot be accommodated. This is all captured in a draft letter um, provided, um, signed by uh, you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to add to that letter or encourage the commission to allow to add to that letter um, that we cite these three attorney general precedents uh, regarding um, the recording of meetings and how that does not violate the open meeting law uh, that could be modified slightly uh, when we send it. So at this time, I'd like to entertain any discussion regarding this among um, the commission members and then move for a vote. Questions to Jared on this action item, please. Mike Beardnock. You recognize Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my only comment is really more of a comment. The, the draft letter that was uh, put together, I'm assuming the format and all that will be cleared up or cleaned up before the, it's finalized. But otherwise, I'm good with the letter. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I'm not saying anything else, Mr. Chair. I'd like to have you move for a motion to approve the letter as drafted, but amended to include uh, reference to past precedent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, who'd like to make a motion? I'll make the motion. Bill, Amaru. Bill Amaru with a motion to approve the draft letter. I need second. a second. Suki Sawyer with a second. Thank you both. We can move to the vote by unanimous consent, Mr. Chair. Yes. Am I seeing any objections? I'm not seeing any objections, Mr. Chair. I will uh, circulate a final letter to the commission, to the complainant, and to the attorney general's office, uh, likely tomorrow. Jared, thank you for your diligence. You're welcome, Mr. Chair. Uh, give me a moment, I'll pull back up the agenda for you. There you go. Okay, second action item, period one, summer flounder trip limit increase. Okay, Ray, um, this is a pr proposal to um, use the in-season uh, adjustments in kind of a pre-season way. Uh, we know from last year's uh, winter fishing performance that we didn't take the full allotment of the, uh, of the quota that we usually set aside for that period. And uh, the memo itself that Nicola uh, contributed to has uh, a description of how this year's quota is actually going to go up even a little higher. And um, it, we're, we're, we're urging the commission to approve an increase from 1,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds uh, to allow the, the offshore fleet to uh, fully utilize the quota. Um, we've gotten some support from the offshore fleet as well as some dealers. We've also gotten some letters in opposition, uh, primarily from the inshore fishery, who believe that um, allowing offshore fishing is, is somehow to um, degrade inshore fishing opportunities. Uh, but we think it's, it's appropriate and, and responsible for us to um, allow the uh, the commercial fisheries to fully utilize the quotas when they're available to the Commonwealth. Uh, 
Nicola, do you want to uh, go over any of the details of the, um, the quota changes that are in the works through the Mid-Atlanta Council? Sure, Dan. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I have a couple of slides that just uh, provide a little bit more uh, information on, on the quota increase that we are anticipating having. Um, as the memo describes, it comes from two separate actions, which are pending um, final approval from NOAA Fisheries, but are anticipated to uh, be published any day now, really. So there is both a, a coastwide quota increase of about 8%, and then also um, the implementing regulations for Amendment 21, which changes the state-by-state -state allocation structure, is it expected to be in place, um, and that reallocates any quota that's above 9.55 million pounds. So collectively, that should increase our quota 29%. Next slide. So taking one at a time, the coastwide quota increase is coming not from a new stock assessment of summer flounder, but from a revision to the Mid-Atlantic Council's risk policy, which is allowing a slightly higher probability of overfishing um, predominantly for stocks that are assessed to be um, above their biomass target. So this graph shows you the, the previous risk policy um, and the blue line and the revised risk policy and the dotted line. Um, and so you can see that as biomass increases, the, um, the ability to, the, the acceptable probability of overfishing is, is just a little bit higher. Um, that vertical line is, is the B over BMSY for the, that's projected for summer flounder next year, which is 0.88. So um, the council's new policy allows the, the probability of overfishing to increase from 0.34 to 0.39. Um, and this is what's leading to that 8% increase in the, in the quota for next year. Next slide. And then Amendment 21, um, essentially what it does is um, it leaves the, the current um, state-by-state allocations in place for any coastwide quota amount up to 9.55 million pounds. So for Massachusetts, that's 6.82%. And then any coastwide quota that is above that 9.55 million pound trigger is allocated in the percentages on the far right. Um, and it's basically split evenly um, at you know, 12 percentage, 12 percent for all the states except for the three that are essentially de minimis states. So the states in, in green are all the states get an increase under this new approach. And um, we essentially um, are taking a, some small amount of quota away from Rhode Island, New Jersey, Virginia, and North Carolina. Next slide. And the, the rationale for that um, amendment has a lot to do with the um, changing spatial distribution of summer flounder. And as just an example, this is um, some plots of uh, vessel trip report data from the commercial fleet. Um, on the left, it's 1994 to 2000 averages. Um, the darker colors um, are associated with higher levels of catch. And then on, on the right hand, it's a more recent um, averaging from 2011 to 2015. And you can see that um, you know, it's, it's kind of truncating on the, on the, on the southern end and focus, being focused more um, in the southern New England, mid-Atlantic area. So um, the, that reallocation amendment responded to trends like this and trying to provide additional access to, to states that are seeing um, an increase in availability. Next slide. And so for Massachusetts, um, we um, were initially expecting to have a commercial quota for 2021 that's about 785,000 pounds. Um, if only the coastwide quota were increasing, we'd get another 65,000 pounds or so. But due to the reallocation amendment, um, it's, it's over 200,000 additional pounds of, of quota. So um, really, the, the bulk of this quota increase, about three quarters of it, is coming from reallocation of quota that would only be landed in other states. So um, based on this increase in Massachusetts of 29% um, and, and wanting to allow our fleet to um, uh, capitalize on, on the reallocation amendment, um, we'd like to have you know, increase the trip limit in the winter period to 2,000 pounds in order to um, hopefully achieve the, the period one fisheries target, which is of 30% of our annual allocation. I think that, that was all I was gonna do, Dan. 
Sure. So I'd like to take a moment and just say how historically significant this is, because I can recall 10 plus years ago when people in our state and within our commission, within our agency started to talk about this and, and demand that, that these kinds of actions take place because it was clear there was a geographic shift uh, in response to ocean warming um, uh, of these species. And Nicola, you'll, you'll be um, probably talking about black sea bass next month uh, after your meeting uh, next week. Um, but this, this took a long time and, and it is um, something that, that we you know, um, requested occur uh, on behalf of the stakeholders and on behalf of the Commonwealth. And um, this, is a, this is a piece of good news, I would say. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing a question from Bill Amaru. By all means, Bill Amaru, you're recognized. Bill, you're muted. Okay, how about now? You're good. Thank you. Uh, it's not a question, it's more of a statement, very much in the same light as the, the one that the director just made concerning how important this observation of quota increase means to the industry. We've waited several generations to be able to say that we're actually gonna get something back for the tremendous sacrifices that the trawl and other fleets have made in reducing their pressure on, on fluke. And now we have something substantial to look at. I'm very, very proud and very pleased to be able to say I support this uh, wholeheartedly. And I can wait, hope that, uh, that someday we'll be talking about increasing quotas in other areas of the fluke fishery as well, the inshore as well as the offshore, I, um, I'm very happy to be able to endorse this and would be pleased to uh, offer a motion that it be accepted. Any other hands, Jared? Mike Piernock. Michael, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you uh, repost the spatial distribution charts that shows the historical spatial distribution over time? Yeah, give me a moment, Mike. I'll pull that Thank back you. up. Thank you. And so if I understand this right, what we're recommending to approve is to increase from 1,000 pounds to 2,000 pounds for the, from January 1st to April 22nd. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Then uh, with that, it, it would, is this fishing in state waters or federal waters? This is primarily fishing that occurs in federal waters during that time. So when yeah, I look I, at this chart, I wouldn't even use the word primarily. I would say it's all federal waters. Okay, and with federal waters, um, if if the boats from uh, let's say New Jersey, can they go off of New Jersey, land them, and then bring them up here and offload them here into Massachusetts? If they're permitted. Okay. Yeah, Mike, we have a limited entry scheme on uh, the the permits to land fluke commercially. Um, you know a. A lot of the trawler fleet does have Massachusetts um, landing permits, but not not all of them. I'd say that most of the vessels fishing in uh, this wintertime fishery and landing in Massachusetts are from the four states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. And and with your with that with what will the 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 fishing pressure which will take place or the commercial harvest that will take place where where on that chart would you say that's going to take place the first quarter? So south of Montauk and the vineyard. I'm sorry, Mike, I didn't hear that. So a significant distance offshore. We're we're talking Gordon's Gully on south, or are we speak in Noman's Island. I would well, presume further Nomans. south of Nomans, this, these tend to be trip boats. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, you've heard from me and others of our concern of what our observations are. There's no doubt that, that we have the biomass, but in our state waters, uh, from we just see fewer recreational size fish to land. But uh, uh, the fact these are going to be offshore, um, I, I would be willing to support this. It's going to be in a federal area. and uh, uh, But as I look at this chart and note where the commercial harvest takes place in, in, in state as well as federal waters over time, it somewhat makes sense of why we see lack of 
fish of any size in those areas and it is consistent with the observations of me and others. But uh, as I said, I ultimately support this. Thank you. Any other hands, Jared? I'm not seeing, oh, Bill Amaru is, Bill? Thank you. I, one more comment about the point just made. I, I think it, it's important to remember that in these areas, these offshore areas where these trawlers have been operating, they've been discarding fluke. These fluke have not recently shown up. The, the quota is what's recently increased. It's going to allow us to land previously discarded fish. And uh, the science is evidently there for it. And, and the lack of inshore fish, I don't think is connected to the, the amount of fish that are taken offshore. I, unfortunately, I believe it has a, it's an environmental situation that we're facing with the inshore fleet. It's affecting not only rod and reel, uh, but also commercial inshore trawler fishermen are fishing in the sound and waters around the islands. Um, hopefully in the future, there'll be a, adjustments that'll occur naturally in the environment that allows fish to return into the inshore waters in good numbers and in larger sizes. But for the time being, they are located offshore and we're converted, we're going to be converting discarded fish into landed fish for the economic benefit of both the, uh, the fishermen and for the, uh, the consumer. So I, I very much and very strongly appreciate the work and, and the size of the quota increase with, with the, uh, the other states uh, allowing us to procure the additional weight that this increase indicates and it's a significant one, one that as I said before, can't get over that it's uh, gone up over a million pounds and that's a, a real positive step. So those are my comments, thank you. Jared, any other hands? Uh, Mike Pierre, knock again. Okay, well, we had Michael's support. Uh, so, Michael, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I do have to respond. I mean, I just can't sit here without a response. But, uh, Bill, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Um, I, that's why I'm in support of it. But I'm just providing observations that we have had over time, at, whether it's from environmental factors or the increased commercial harvest. Uh, it's not clear what is the case other than the fact that we see fewer size, recreational size fish, they all linger around the size of commercial fish in Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound and to some extent Nantucket Sound. I wish I, I had the ability to go 50 miles and it would make economic sense between Chatham and Nantucket Shoals because that's the, that's the honey hole for these guys. But other than that, I'm providing the observations. I'm not sure why. And I don't think the Department or Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission has indicated why that may be the case because of environmental factors or, or harvest. So, um, but as I said, I, I support it and I, I agree with many things you've said and um, I'm in support of it. Thank you. Any other hands, Jared? Bill Amor. Bill, are you That's ready me. for a motion? Yes, I am. Please. I make the motion in favor. Bill, right, we have a motion in favor to adopt where I'm looking for a second. Second. Bill Doyle with a second. Thank you, Bill. All those in favor, is anybody in opposition? I'm not seeing any hands raised in opposition. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Jared. Let's move on to our next action item. I believe it's Scup. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Ray. <laughs> um, I just want to let the commission know that um, I'm going to work hard in, in the, in, as my tenure in, as director to see if we can't avoid bringing these SCUP uh, changes before the commission because they're simply uh, adopting a federal standard. There's literally no um, uh, fishing that's, that's going to go on in state waters, um, especially during the period one with the winter fishery. And yet, we have to come to you. Have to, we have to op, uh, conduct public comment periods under the regulations, and we have to get the votes from you. But we're really just uh, uh, complementing the federal standards. So I'm, I'm going to, I'll be working with you and with the staff to, um, to find a way to uh, streamline this. Uh, it's, it is, it, it, it kind of, you know, uh, jams up our agendas, um, and it's just so routine and not very meaningful for us to be making these rule changes. Uh, there's gotta be a better way. But having said that, um, it's, a, it's a simple uh, adoption of the
the federal standard that is in existence for the offshore fleet. Um, and, um, you know, when the law enforcement officers go to the ports and enforce this, they are, uh, they are uh, deputized as NOAA enforcement officers so they can um, enforce federal rules. But, but nonetheless, we're here today. We'd like you to approve the, uh, the 50,000 pound trip limit for SCUP. Uh, it is a, uh, a species that's not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. And um, we, I believe the quotas routinely come in uh, lower than the targets on a, on a continued basis on, on, for all three periods. Um, Nicola, do you wanna fill in any gaps that I've left? I think you covered it, Dan. All right. So let's come back to the action item. You've heard Dan's rationale. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing a question from Suki Sawyer. Suki, you're recognized. Not a question, Ray, just making a motion. Okay. Thank you. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Shelly Edmondson. Thank you, Dr. Edmondson. Is anybody in opposition to this motion? I'm not seeing any votes in opposition. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Give me you chair the uh, this is gonna be 4A, petition to lift the bluefish strike net closure in Eastern Cape Cod Bay. Who's gonna deal with this one, Dan? Yeah, let me start. Um, we've been uh, requested by the lone strike netter uh, who's permitted for this activity to um, consider uh, lifting or amending this, uh, this closure. Uh, I, I would bring to your attention the, uh, the memo that has been uh, distributed with the map uh, on the cover, uh, on the cover page. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good description of the history of this. Um, it's, it's a really interesting history. And I think Phil Coates is listening in. And, and I have to say that I spent some time uh, up in the lonely office by myself a couple of weeks ago when I was researching back to this time period and these actions. And it was really amazing um, what, you know, the, the, what I saw in terms of the the amount of public, uh, I'll call it discourse, but a lot of arguing back and forth about future management of the bluefish fishery. Uh, there was uh, uh, perceptions and maybe reality of a, of a growing gillnet fishery. Uh, the agency uh, did its best to, um, you know, place, you know, Solomon cutting the baby in half, so to speak. And uh, we wound up with a whole set of rules, and one of them was uh, limited entry on on uh, on gillnet permits. We also have a whole suite of rules about the bluefish gillnetting, and this particular uh, uh, closure was uh, done, I think, in a second iteration of the regulation of this activity um, to uh, minimize the interactions between recreational, especially charter boat operators, in southeastern Cape Cod Bay. What's really interesting about the time period back then is that this was a time when the striped bass fishery was at its lowest point and bluefish was the, the number one target for the recreational fishery. And I think there was just that concern. And also it was prior to the bluefish management plan, the federal plan. And so, you know, I, I think back at, at the challenges that, that the director had in the early 1980s and without the guardrails of overall quotas and without the guardrails of, of, of um, uh, set-asides or proportions given to the commercial and to the rec fishery, uh, you know, there was a lot of pressure on, on the agency to do the right thing, to either promote commercial fishing or to, or to eliminate commercial fishing for the species. And there was actually a lot of uh, dialogue and even a petition to make striped bat, I'm sorry, make bluefish a, a uh, create a management scheme that was just like striped bass, which was uh, hook and line only. Uh, we didn't get to that point. Um, we, we have a whole set of rules. The, 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 and what we're left with today is uh, a quota. It's a modest quota, uh, especially given the, um, the status of the stock. Uh, we have one strike netter, um, uh, and, and many other hook and line fishermen 
that do participate in, in the fishery. Um, I, I don't have a complete description of all the landings by gear type, but I, I think it's, uh, it's sufficient to say that those two gears represent uh, a vast, vast majority of the total landings. And so, um, so now we're, we're facing a uh, sort of a, a request to re-examine this particular area closure. And I am interested in, in bringing this forward uh, to the public. Um, you know, some options could be in, in a final recommendation could be to just do the seasonally, you know, like after the, the height of the recreational season, it could be to just redraw the lines. But uh, I would like to see uh, the opportunity for these uh, quotas to be filled, um, you know, for the good of, of, of the uh, of the seafood industry. I, I know that the fish uh, is uh, that comes in um, in that particular gear is a really a select product. Um, I see it in, in Whole Foods uh, for, for some pretty high price per pound because it, it is such high quality. And I believe that uh, given the history of, of this particular operator and his ability to coexist with the um, uh, with his uh, fellow fishermen in the in the area, I, I think that this uh, could be done. So I welcome the discussion, um, but it's it's interesting to think back to the 40 years that's transpired, and and uh, so we're in one aspect of this, we're looking back, uh, and another, we're sort of looking forward, um, you know, with with uh, a desire to fully utilize that quota because. As, as you know, Ray, it's, it's not always that you lose quota that you don't use, um, but it is always a fear that, um, that any jurisdiction has. Um, and, and I would prefer to, to maintain a, the viable commercial sector uh, if I could, uh, if we could, uh, for this particular species. So why don't we generate some discussion or if, if folks are just uh, satisfied that we, that if we move forward with a public hearing proposal um, at, at a future public hearing. But I, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I found it really interesting looking back at some of those, those old um, correspondences. And to be honest, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at Phil's performance in, in a lot of those, in a lot of those uh, correspondences and uh, he, he really had a rough, a rough time. Uh, uh, it was a difficult time to be director. I, I have to admit, I think it's easier today a lot of these issues have been fought and, and resolved and, and uh, we're sort of the beneficiary of, um, of a lot of the past negotiations and hard work of the, our commissions, past commissions and uh, my, my uh, previous directors. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Director McKinnon. And I'd like to open it to the floor for discussion. Khalil? Thank you, Jared. Um, I, um, I like the idea, uh, Director, about the um, re-examining uh, possibilities of moving that line. And I really appreciate the fact, because that was my question. I, was, I, I like the historical uh, information you gave us regarding how and why that line was drawn and where the closure is, that historical perspective. And um, I'd like to hear from, I've already heard from some of the recreational anglers from that area regarding this this proposal, and uh, I, I, I I like your your, your thoughts about possibly. Uh, I know it's a single uh, gill netter, and I know there are other probably commercial uh, hook and line commercial uh, fishermen out there, but I, I rather than just go, go with this uh, eliminating it and let the strike gill netter into that area, I do like the. And I'm not anti-commercial by any means, because I, I need to say that right off the bat. Because um, everybody needs to make a living, and, and this is a living for for the commercial fishermen. Uh, I, I'd like I'd like to see some options regarding the seasonal or seasonality of moving that line. Uh, when I uh, like the idea of what if the recreational anglers are are less active, allowing the gill netter to come into that. That particular area. So I like, I really like that. And I think we need to continue this discussion rather than saying this is the way it's going to be. Uh, I like the idea of the, you know, the, the variations of the, the line being drawn during certain times of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. Mike Pierdon. 
Michael, you recognize. Uh, I have a question, and then comments. Um, would this commercial, the, the individual uh, that would like to open this up, um, is his permit transferable? Dan? Michael, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I can recall a time when the commission uh, requested the agency at a meeting, I think uh, over 20 years ago, uh, to retire those permits, but we can't find anything on the record. And I, I think that's it's an open okay. question. Yeah. Like I, I, sure. I would sure say, is. I would say it may be, but um, but I'm I'm willing to listen. But okay, um, if, you, yeah. if you could look into that, please. Um, well, well, Mike, we have, and we can't we can't find anything uh, that matches our one of our memories. Sure. That, that the commission had requested that not be transferred. But um, so, so anyway, um, it's, I think it's an open question and, and I think it's something that, that the commission uh, might wanna uh, have a discussion about. Sure. Um, in response to uh, the request, um, a number of different charter boat captains from the Cape and the South shore that significantly rely in this area have reached out to me. Uh, as well as recreational anglers. You know, it's interesting to note what you indicated as the, the, ho uh, the hoops and the concerns and the hurdles that yet had to be overcome back when this came up a number of years ago. Because in a sense, really nothing's changed. It is the same. Uh, that The fleet that relies on that, uh, 20 to 30 charter boats rely on that significantly throughout the entire season. And, and you know, no doubt that recreationally it goes down after Labor Day, but for the four hire fleet, those 20 to 30 boats are still out there all the way into November. And it's a combination of two things. It's, it's uh, for the charter boat fleet, uh, lots of them that just do striped bass and bluefish, uh, they rely on one or the other. That's the place you go to get bluefish to save the day. And whether that's in the summer months or whether that's in the fall, uh, that, that's what they rely upon for that, in addition to getting bait for uh, catching uh, commercial bluefin tuna. So um, I'm not sure where those are concluding that it, it drops off during the, the fall months. It is not the case. And there's a significant amount of boats that do rely on it. Now, there's two things also to note that are similar, that similar to a repeat of history is that we now have the slot limit for striped bass. We used to be able to catch two per angler per day. We're down to one with a slot limit. We're relying more on uh, bluefish to save the day. And those, those, there's those boats, as you know, that's all they do is bluefish and striped bass. And they got to rely on one of the others. So there's a lot of similarities now as we had back then. Now, all the old timers have been around. I wasn't around when this went into place and been fishing for years they do have the utmost respect for the, the petitioner. He's, he's a nice guy and, and so on. And he, he is very uh, respectful when he's on the water to make sure there's not a conflict. But the, the, the truth is what happens is, is that if, if we go there and or recreational or for hire fleet go there and land uh, bluefish and we see him there, he comes in in the afternoon, he lands them and they're gone. And it, there's no fish there for the next two to three weeks, if, it, if at all they ever return. So that, that, that was also one of the concerns uh, if, if you did permit them in there. Well, ultimately, this is a repeat of history. I, I really don't see much different other than there seems to be a misinterpretation and misrepresentation in here that it's not used and it is still significantly used by the four hire fleet all the way through November and it's an area they rely on. And as I said, many have reached out to me and they're adamantly against it. And um, I thank you for, for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other hands, Jared? Bill Amaru. William, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, uh, I stand in support of Tom Smith's letter to the division about changing the line or eliminating it. Personally, I, if it were up to me, I would call for it to be removed totally. The difference between the fishery uh, as it stood in 1980, when the permits were first issued and Tom started fishing in 81 to what it is today is so much different as to almost be 
not even in the same category. He's a single boat that fishes one net and it's been mentioned how conscientious and how white, well, well like Tom is. And uh, his need for uh, access as the fishery has evolved and changed, uh, <laughs> it only seems to make sense to me that this one boat with one net, highly respected by the local fleet, I don't know of a single charter boat out of the fleet of Rock Harbor who would oppose Tom's uh, ability to, to access these areas. He would purposely be away from the area where the boats are trolling for bluefish or fishing for them. Uh, I support it strongly, and uh, I hope that the, the Commonwealth will see that the differences between the reasons this area is established and the reasons that it needs to continue today are, are simply light years apart. By the way, uh, Deanna, I don't know if it's going to be any help to you or not, but according to what Tom has told me, his permit will dissolve when he leaves the fishery. It will not be transferable. So that's what he understands it to be, and yeah. I, I don't know about the... Uh, you know, the ability to access the actual documents that will prove that. But I've asked him about it and we mm -hmm. talked about this at some length. And that was his comment to me. So anyway, um, with all due respect to the charter boat fleet, and I understand that everybody's is, is up against it these days with the conditions that we're fishing under as things rapidly change environmentally. Uh, I don't want to see anybody not have an opportunity to, to provide fish to their customers. But I really don't think that, that Tom's uh, one net fish the way he fishes conscientiously away from the boats that are that are targeting fish in certain areas will have any impact whatsoever. Thank you, Bill. Any other hands? Jared. I'm not seeing any of the comments, Mr. Chair. Hello, this is uh, Tim Brady. Oh, hi, Tim. Hi. Um, if, if I may, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody. Um, yeah, I, I would um, echo um, what Mike Perdinock said. Um, this, this area is an area that the charter fleet from Provincetown, uh, Rock Harbor, Wellfleet, Sandwich, and Plymouth, you know, if you add all those boats up, it's, it's certainly over 100 um, charter boats. You know, they're, they are, you know, the, the gold standard is striped bass. Everybody wants to striped bass, but then you have the conversation with the, the clients who are spending anywhere from 800 to 1500 bucks to go out fishing for the day, do you, you know, are you okay if we, um, you know, fish bass all day and don't get a keeper? We want to try for a keeper because honestly, we haven't got a keeper in a week. Um, or do you, are you interested in bringing dinner home? Because if you're interested in bringing dinner home, we're going to have to try to big fish. And, and then you're down to where are bluefish in Cape Cod Bay? Uh, the bluefish season in Plymouth for the last three years has been about a week <laughs> at the end of July and beginning of August on the end of Browns Bay. And that's it. And that's the only bluefish that we see there um, during the year over the last few years. So now um, you're heading for this area. This is, this is the area. And this is all the boats you know, from Provincetown, like I said, all the way around to Plymouth and as well as the Green Harbor fleet. I should have gone a little north there they're all heading um, in, in that area too. So I, I can't support this. Um, I know it's a small area, but as Mike said, I don't, I don't think anything's really changed. It was, it was set aside because, um, you know, you had, at the time you had a dearth of striped bass. So people were actually targeting the bluefish. Now we have a lot of striped bass but they're not recreational size. So if they're not a recreational size fish and your party is really interested in bringing some fillets home for dinner, you got to target bluefish. And in Cape Cod Bay, that's, that's where the bluefish are. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate it. It sounds like the gentleman who's, you know, looking for this opening, you know, is very responsible and well-respected, but um, I, I can't support this. Um, so thank you. Yeah, Ray. Um, I I think this is this is really useful uh, telegraphing. Um, I under the statute, um, you know, the the director can still put this on the on a public hearing agenda, which I'd I'd like to do. Um, I, I don't feel that this would need to pass a um, like a preliminary vote by the commission in order to go forward. I really I do feel we should take this out, but I would like to address what's changed. 
What's changed since the early 80s is there's a bluefish management plan now, which means we have a state quarter. We didn't have a quarter back then. Um, from my reading of the record, there was talk about up to six gill netters that were uh, involved in the fishery. And now um, we are down to uh, the single. And striped bass is far more abundant. And I think that um, the slot, the, the, the number of fish that's gonna be available to the rec sector between 28 and, and 35 inches um, is expected to be far more uh, abundant this year. And to back me up on that, I, I would turn to Mike Armstrong to see if he has a, a, any comments on what the rec striped bass fishery would, ex, would see this year uh, for abundance in the slide. Michael, you're recognized. Okay. Um, the 2011 year class, let's see, will be uh, nine, 10. So they'll be in the slot this year. Um, I think we're going to see more slot fish. There, there was a whole lot from the 2015 year class that are just shy. Some of the fast growers from the 2015 uh, at six, some will be in 28 inches, not that many. Um, but over the next couple of years, the, the number of fish in the slot will grow because of the 2015 uh, and 2014 actually was pretty good too. So uh, whereas we heard over and over, there wasn't a lot of slot fish um, this year, I, I think you're gonna see more. There's, there's just going to be, um, from those two year classes, uh, I think better fishing in the slot. Thank you, Mike. So Mike Dan, Fairnock, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair, but Mike Fairnock has his hand raised. For Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dan. Um, you, you make some good points. I mean, last year, uh, the, the, those fishing in this area you had a good two weeks where you had fish that were in the slot limit. And then that's where the rest of the year, there was nothing but small ones where, uh, when I say fish striped bass, where we had to rely on that blue fish to put put food in the, on the plate or get food for the those that are uh, on the, the charters, as uh, Tim Brady had pointed out, that, that's important. The other thing you need to keep in mind, I understand what you're saying about the uh, where the, 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 the biomass is and where they're going to be in the slot limit for next year. But as we've observed, there's a tremendous fish, a tremendous shift of the fish from Boston Harbor on north. So what we may want or expect to see, we may not necessarily see within this area. Uh, but it ultimately comes down to, um, I specifically have charter boats from uh, Rock Harbor and Sessuit and those areas from P-Town to Green Harbor that rely in that area, 20 to 30 of them, and rely in that area through November. Thank you. Uh, any other hands raised, Jared? Uh, I've seen Khalil raise and unraise his hand, so I'm not certain if he has a follow-up question, but Khalil, if you do. Yeah, I'm not hearing from yeah, Khalil. I, 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 I just unmuted myself. Uh, thank you. I had my hand up and I, I had, I had uh, several thoughts. Uh, Director, uh, are you considering taking this out to public hearing? I heard you say that. And... Uh, I, I, I can't, I, I lost my thought. Of, let me, let me yeah. come back if I do, let me come back. But I, I'm curious as to whether or not this, this item would be going out to public hearing. Yeah, I, I would like to take it to public hearing. I, I think an interpretation of the statute um, says that I can, I think this, this conversation is, is kind of a courtesy to, to um, so you all can understand like what the issues are and, and, um, give us your initial thoughts. Um, you know, the, the statute says, you know, that an, an interested party, a citizen can petition uh, the director and, and then the, the director um, to, goes out to, to public hearing with the items that I, I believe uh, under our current interpretation of the statute, um, I, could, I could renege, I could, I could like refuse to take it out to public hearing, but I'm 
I'm predisposed to wanting to take it out to public hearing. Uh, the commission's role would be to um, reject uh, my uh, or accept my proposal uh, after public hearing. And so, um, but if if the if this commission, you know, rose up to me and said, you know, if, if it was clear that there's that there's absolutely no interest in even getting public input on this one, then um, I think I'm. I'm uh, I'm not tone deaf, you know. I, <laughs> but it's not necessary that I'm uh, that I'm I, that I need a majority vote. I've I've heard from two members of the of this commission who expressed opposition to to this. Um, there's seven more of you, so um, so that's my thinking on this. Yes. Uh, one again. Uh, thank you. Once again, uh, we're, what we're doing is we're um, we're affecting someone's livelihood. I hate that think that, that we would be inhibiting or prohibiting someone from uh, making a living uh, through, the, through the fishery. Uh, and, it, and it goes both ways. It's, you know, we have the commercial, we have the, the, uh, the charters, at charters, and we have the uh, recreational anglers, and then we have the gill netters. And once again, we got to have a conundrum where we have a, 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 a meeting where uh, one wants something and the other doesn't want something. And I, I, I would like to see, and, I, and I, I'm going to go back to your statements about flexibility and moving that line over different, different periods of time. And I understand what Mike uh, Piardnock was saying about the fishery still exists in, in November. Uh, and, and more than likely the people who would be charting those fish in November would be the, the charter boats. And I really like to see a compromise. Uh, I don't want to exclude anybody from making a living. But also, I don't want uh, people inter interacting or, or interfering with uh, other people's businesses. So, I like the idea of of, of a moving target regarding uh, seasonality to this line, and I think that should be examined a little bit closer. And I do firmly believe that this should go out to uh, mm -hmm. public hearing. If I were to, if you were to ask me to vote on it today, I would say I would be against it. Um, for some of the reasons that uh, the other com commissioners had mentioned, and uh, but I'm I'm pleased that we're not going to take a consensus vote today, but rather that you'll take this out, and we can discuss this more in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Khalil. I I would add that um, this year we actually transferred uh, a fair amount of our quota. Uh, Nicola helped me out. We we transferred about 50,000 pounds of our quarter to North Carolina, uh, which is a state that's given us fish many years in the past. Um, we waited until the third week of October and we made that transfer because honestly, when we look at the historical record, uh, we don't see any bluefish being landed after the third week of October. So I'm not sure of the, the dependence on this area well into November when our, our, his, our historical commercial landings records show uh, almost no fish being landed, um, you know, fish that are worth money, even, with, even among those in the, in the rod and reel fishery. Um, there's money to be made. People usually catch fish and sell it, and, and we literally don't see any landings. Uh, Nicola, do you want to uh, you know, uh, make any comment on that? Uh, I'll just say that we gave some to both North Carolina and Rhode Island um, after yeah. we were certain that we were, we were not going to need it. Yeah. Uh, may, may I ask another question? By yep. all means, Khalil. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate this. Um, do we have a figure on this particular person, this gill netter? Have, uh, what the amount of uh, poundage that he's bringing in? Well, we, we do, but, but because of confidentiality standards, um, we're not allowed to uh, release any landings records that have fewer than three um, entities within the within the, the, that particular statistic. Okay. So those those figures would would have to remain confidential. Let me let me ask a, a follow up question to that. Then, do we have figures of landings uh, for um, for bluefish from from uh, open line for from that area? Well, we, yeah, I mean, that, that area is, is not a, um, is not a 
complete statistical reporting area that, that we could uh, query the database. Um, the statistical reporting area for that zone extends from about race point down to the canal. That in itself is a statistical reporting area. So if we presented landings data to you, uh, it would be for an area probably twice as large, two or three times larger than that. And that's as refined as we could get. And even then we wouldn't be able to uh, parse out the, 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 this particular individual's landings because of the confidentiality standards. Let me, let me follow up with another question. Is there a large, if that in large may be an uh, improper word to use, or is there, is there a, a, a large number of, or can you give me the number of hook and line uh, commercial uh, fishermen for bluefish? Do you have that information? Yeah, we would be able to do it, um, but, but we don't have that data today, but we'll prepare that before we go to, to, to public hearing. We'll give you more information on that. Thank you, Mr. Director. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'm seeing Lou Williams. Lou, by all means, you're recognized. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes Lou. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember when Phil Coates, when this was all, a lot of this was going on because I was at a meeting and there was a, uh, a group of uh, recreational guys that were, um, you know, they wanted to be in the commercial landing of bluefish because they were seeing less and less of them, you know. So I gave him a history lesson on it while we were there. And part of that, because bluefish are an interesting species. Uh, 1971, uh, my father got him in his mackerel trap off of Swampskit. He'd had a trap there since 1942. He'd never seen them before. We'd never seen them. Never seen a bluefish in his life. Uh, and they showed up and they were really thick. And then over time, they started to go away to the point there's none now. I mean, I didn't go gill net in the summer, but the summer before I caught one bluefish the whole summer. Um, I think, unfortunately, what happens with these bluefish with this, they have such a strange cycle. When they start becoming less abundant, and I, you know, because it used to be able to, when they showed up up here back in the 70s, man, you, you, I wouldn't go to school. I'd see them on the beach and I'd go fishing for them. But, um, yeah, hang on one second. Sorry. Give me five minutes, all right? Um, so, unfortunately, what happens when the bluefish do their cycle, the finger gets pointed at the commercial fisherman. It's, all, it's his fault. Um, these things are just changing, and I'm sure this guy's seeing less and less, just like, um, uh, like you're saying, off of Plymouth, they're saying they only get them from a week. Yeah, we're well, lucky even getting them from what I see up here on the North Shore. They're just gone. And there was another fellow that had the trap before my father's name was Charlie Cajon. He died about 30 years ago. He was 100 years old. And he told me the bluefish showed up from 1930 to 1938. Then they disappeared and he never saw another one until my father saw him in 1971. So everyone wants to say overfishing, 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 but nobody fished for bluefish back then uh, at any amount. And they just seem to, you know, uh, have a very weird cycle how they come and go and they'll disappear for years for decades you know from areas so so i just wanted to give that you know food for thought you know and i and also i gotta i'm looking at that area and dan maybe you can answer me how, how many fathoms of twine can this guy fish with the uh, strike net uh, dan sorry i was muted um that's a good question, Jared. Do you know what the what the um, the gear restrictions are on the on the permit? Give me a moment. I'll see if I can't pull that up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you recognize Bill, Bill Amarillo. Uh, yeah, I've talked to Tom about the depth of his fishing. This net is a shallow net. It has to touch the bottom for it to be effective. Otherwise, the fish swim under it. He's limited to about twenty feet of depth. Right. Yeah, I didn't know how long it was. Um, Bill, you know, how many yeah. fathoms? Uh, it's it's 1,500 feet is the maximum. I don't think he uses a maximum, but that's the maximum Fif on his permit. 1,500 feet, so five, so uh, six, go, 300 fathoms. That's it, okay. So that's not much twine. But I, right, I, I push back on Mike Paddock. I think a guy can go up to 300 fathoms of twine and fish out in that whole area in one day. I mean, I, I, I think that's people that just, that's, that's crazy to even think that gets possible, you know? 
Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll, 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 uh, that's, that's all I wanted to say about a little history lesson on bluefish that I've observed and seen and witnessed and been there. And uh, uh, I'll be in support of this course to go out to public hearing and uh, let's see what happens. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, and I can confirm, Bill Amaru, that it is a 1500 maximum uh, net length. Yes. Yes, I too would like to see it throughout the public <clears throat> hearing just to answer some of these questions that we're getting quite a few of. Yeah, okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm saying Mike Peardnock. Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm, one thing to add, what has changed over time is uh, our bluefin tuna fishery. And for higher boats, can go after giants uh, uh, with the appropriate permits and so on, as well as general category individuals, many of which are recreational fishermen. So they go to this area in November to catch uh, bluefish as well as throughout the season, but specifically in November to get live bluefish then to use to, to land um, bluefin. So that, that has changed over time. That's what's behind the need uh, or use during the November months. If you do choose to go out for public comment, uh, I personally don't agree for that to occur because from the outcry that I have received in the little bit of time that this has hit the street has been consistent with the history and the basis behind why this was closed in the first place. Uh, the number of charter boats from those areas throughout the Cape from P-Town to Plymouth, select captains are not for it. There's a few organizations that have not been able to sit down and come to a conclusion because of COVID, uh, but I'm sure, uh, or they're likely gonna come out also against it, but I can't guarantee you until I get it from them. But there are quite a few against this and uh, I would prefer it doesn't go out, but if you do, you're going to get uh, significant response from the recreational and for hire community, as well as those organizations that represent, represent them. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So Dan, what are we gonna do here? Are we gonna go? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think it's appropriate to, to take it to a future public hearing and um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, obviously, you know, we've got a lot of endurance built up after the hearings we've had the last two nights, <laughs> so. So we, uh, you know, this is what we do. So, um, you know, let's, let's, uh, I'll take it to public hearing and, and the commission can deliberate on this and, um, and we'll, we'll see, or we'll see what, what comes back. I will, uh, I will, I'm sure I will learn uh, a lot uh, as the commission members will to, to get more information. Um, and it'll force us to sort of dust off a lot of, a lot of the records and answer some of the questions like Khalil has put forward about uh, the, the hook and line commercial fishery. So, yeah, I, I this this has been a great discussion. I, I thank the commission members for their for their contributions to this. Very good. So we're talking about public hearings in what month? Oh, Jared, maybe sure, April. I could speculate a bit a bit on that. Um, I'd expect it would probably be um, in April, the late March to April public hearing. Um, and any final recommendation would then probably come back to the commission at either an April or May business meeting. Uh, that would be my uh, initial um, outline on that. Thank you. All and right. Mr. Chair, I'm seeing Bill Amherst still has his hand up. I'm not sure if he has an additional Bill, you're comment. Recognized. Bill, you're recognized. Okay, I'm going to assume Bill doesn't have an additional yep, comment. Sorry, I, oh. I, I have my mistake. I thought it was down. I'm done. Thank you, Bill. Thank All you, right, Mr. Darren. Chair. I'll move the um, agenda back up on the screen for you. Please do. Okay, update on protected species rulemaking timeline. We've had some uh, interesting public hearings the past two nights. Who's going to take the lead on this, Dan? 
Yeah, I, I will start and I'd ask Bob and, and um, Aaron to su support uh, me and, and fill in again any gaps. Dan, but, do you uh, want to watch the public uh, presentation at all? <laughs> hmm. You want to throw the public hearing, um, the notice? Docket. Yeah, just maybe the notice. I think that will um, spur. All right, gentlemen, after we get that up on the screen, after this item, we're going to take a biological break for 10 minutes before we go into discussion items. So let's get this up and on the screen. Actually, you know, Ray, you, I, can I make a recommendation you do that break now? Okay. How yeah. does everybody feel? We're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at, well, I don't have a 1052. 1052. Thank you, Dan. Okay. 1052. We're back in session. Okay, Ray. Um, Next on the agenda is a uh, discussion of the timeline of our uh, protected species regs. And I think it also is an opportunity for any of the commission members who um, are following this to ask us some clarifying questions, but also maybe um, share some observations from uh, one or both of the last two nights where we had uh, some really impressive uh, participation on Zoom calls, uh, the, the public hearings um, on Tuesday night, I think we exceeded uh, or reached about 220 attendants, which was pretty amazing. Um, you know, the, the upside to this uh, technology and this, and this, uh, this mode of, of holding hearings is that um, no one has to drive halfway across the state uh, late at night to attend a meeting. Um, you could do it from the convenience of your home. Um, so it, it was a really an impressive array of attendance. And, um, you know, we, I would cl uh, classify the meetings as, uh, as really pretty polite, um, well conducted. Jared, as usual, uh, managed the meetings really well as he does these meetings. Um, but um, at the same time, I, I can't, you know, I woke up this morning with a little bit of a, of a, proverbial hangover because um, DMF, uh, we're, we're in a difficult position right now. Um, we have uh, a fishing industry that is uh, facing more and more restrictions. Um, you know, there was a lot of really heartfelt um, frustration among uh, some of the participants in the commercial fishing side last night about, um, you know, when's it gonna end? How much is enough? Uh, can they continue to make a living? Um, on the other hand, we got some really pointed uh, criticism from some of the, uh, not all, but some of the NGOs and non-governmental organizations, um, you know, really critical of us uh, not promoting ropeless fishing at this time. And, um, you know, it's, there's, there's a pretty big gap between those two. One thing that we mentioned last night that I should mention uh, today to the commission is that Bob Glenn um, has uh, worked on a, a federal grant that has been awarded to us for about a couple hundred thousand dollars to uh, work on a, an investigation of what the obstacles are to successfully uh, transition to the so-called ropeless fishing. What, for those of you on the call who may not know, ropeless fishing really means that um, the, the Either a buoy comes to the surface upon some kind of a trigger mechanism that could be um, that could be with a signal of some kind, um, or the whole trap itself comes to the surface, some kind of another, like a lift bag or something. Uh, it is the kinds of technologies that are routinely used by oceanographic uh, scientists to retrieve um, devices on the ocean floor. Uh, in other words, it's 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 well it's it, you know it's well uh, well established that you can put something on the ocean floor and retrieve it. What's not well established is the ability of uh, many other users to know where it is, you know, and to avoid it. And what we're particularly concerned about is 
the um, the headlong rush into ropeless fishing is extraordinarily expensive. First of all, uh, the, fir the the estimate of the current cost of these devices, uh, Bob did it back of the envelope calculation that um, it could cost a hundred million dollars for the Massachusetts fishery to to rig their gear with these devices. Now. Um, we're assured by the proponents that this uh, will come down in price, you know, like any device, you know, they say your the first iPhone was very expensive, but, you know, when you mass produce it, uh, you know, of course, the, the price comes down. So there is some uh, promise or expectation that price per units could come down. But, um, you know, we still think that it's going to cause, uh, it's going to turn fisheries management on its ear uh, if, we uh, have to zone the ocean or the second half of the challenge, of course, is it's easy to, to bring the buoy to the surface or bring the gear to the surface. That's well, that's well understood. What's not uh, as easy is to um, create technologies and a reliable system so that if your gear is on the ocean floor, then the, the, next, per, the next fisherman can be aware of it to avoid it or to avoid setting over it or to avoid towing through it if you're a drag or a scalper. Um, there was a, an outstanding presentation by the National Marine Fishery Service at last week's council meeting that uh, we will be uh, happy to share with you. The, this particular part of the presentation was clipped for our purposes and we'll, I'll share that with you. It's about 45 minutes. And there was some really great discussion around the table about uh, the, the challenges of, um, of what's going on with right whales and what's going on with ropeless fishing. So, um, you know, we've, we've, got a, we've got the two sides fairly far apart and DMF at this point is caught in the middle. Um, I can say that uh, the grant that Bob has, has uh, won, uh, we're going to uh, hire a contractor who is knowledgeable in this area and is going to um, conduct a series of interviews and in-depth analyses of these uh, fisheries and gears around the world where some of this technology is being used. And um, that's going to, uh, you know, reveal or inform everyone of uh, what are the challenges to make this happen? Financial, logistical, societal, safety, you know, what, what are all the issues? And he's going to be conducting um, at least 50 interviews of, of key participants. So, so that's sort of what we were left with at the end of the night is there was demands from the NGOs that, that our hearing last night didn't even address the, uh, what, their, what their favorite topic is, is, is moving the fishery to ropeless. Uh, meanwhile, we have these proposals that we would like to bring um, recommendations to you uh, on January 7th uh, for implementation uh, in time for February um, or or for next year, depending on the item. And uh, part of this is us anticipating the large whale take reduction plans details that we're convinced are going to be in the plan uh, because Massachusetts and other states all submitted uh, its, its plan. And we've shared this with you, the commission at past meetings. And so, um, so the proposals that we came out with last night do two things. They anticipate the large whale take reduction plan, like I said, NIMS is going to be coming out imminently with their proposed final rule, and the final final rule is expected by May. But with whales uh, on our doorstep and coming in, uh, we would like to um, accelerate the adoption of some of these rules. The second thing that's in play is this court decision, Judge Telwani um, uh, ordering us to come up with an incidental take permit. And I know in a past presentation, Bob has explained that in order to get an incidental take permit, you have to uh, apply for um, a, a permit to the National Marine Fishery Service, and you have to have the details of your fishery and of your conservation plan kind of in, in place. And so that's why we're uh, rushing forward a little bit um, because come next summer, there's going to be another opportunity for the National Marine Fishery Service to consider the Massachusetts pot and trap fishery for lobsters and, and then other species down south uh, in our southern waters uh, for an ITP for, uh, for the incidental taking of right whales and we think leatherback turtles as well 
the, the right whale takes, uh, just to help the commission re uh, recollect the incidents, uh, we, in 2016, we did have a single uh, known entanglement in Massachusetts gear, uh, lobster gear. The, the uh, animal towed the, the gear out to uh, the, the Stellwagen Bank area. It was disentangled by the professionals at the Center for Coastal Studies and uh, the whale lived happily ever after. It was a non-lethal entanglement. Uh, 11 years ago, there was a single lobster trap entanglement that occurred that was also a successful disentanglement. Um, nonetheless, um, the, the judge and the plaintiff, uh, well, the judge specifically are looking at those cases saying, you know, you need to have an incidental take permit for, to cover these takes. So that's why we are proposing what we're proposing and on the schedule that we're proposing it. So uh, the public has until Friday, uh, next Friday, the 16th, I believe, um, or the 18th, to, um, to submit comments. And I think we're going to get a lot of comments. I mean, you, you can imagine uh, the, the past two nights we had uh, over 220 participates on one call. And then the next night we had well over 100. There was some overlap, but uh, it's conceivable we could have 250, you know, well, well uh, thought out letters for for you all to be reading. Yeah, and we have over 400 at the moment. Yeah, so this is a big one, right? This is probably one of the more challenging issues that you're probably going to be faced with as a commission and with us as an agency. And it is kind of an existential crisis for uh, a lot of people, for, for right whales, for commercial fishermen, for, for regulators, for the uh, lawyers that are dealing with this. And, and we've gotten some uh, really great representation in the litigation from the Attorney General's office at the at the um, Administrative Law Bureau um, and, uh, and and also from the EEA and DFG attorneys. So it is a very time consuming and, and detailed uh, activity for us, uh, notably uh, myself, uh, Bob and Aaron, but we also drag Jared and we drag Story into it. And of course, when we go to get this incidental take permit, we have to uh, depict sort of the the fishery in its entirety, like the who, what, when, where, how, what do they catch? And that means we need to knock on the door of our stats project, the same stats project that uh, carried the day for us in the CARES Act. Is they have to uh, come through with a whole bunch of fresh analyses for us. So, you know, Bob has a pretty detailed job that goes well beyond protected species, but in his recent uh, months, uh, he has been doing almost predominantly protected species work. Uh, and this is really challenging. So, so thank you for letting me drone on and on here, but it, it is an important issue for us. And uh, Ray, I think if the commission members want to uh, ask us questions or, or you know, provide their perspectives on what they heard at the, at the meeting last two nights, I think that would be appropriate. Okay, I only have one question. I'll open this up. I don't need to know the names of participants but Jared, how many of our commission members participated in either or one of those nights, Tuesday or Wednesday? Uh, there was a good turnout. I'd say uh, four to five uh, attended both hearings. Good, thank you. Uh, yeah. And, and the hearings are also available um, on our website through our YouTube channel. If anyone wants to you know, spend the time to go back and listen to some of the comments, you can me slide forward to the to, to that portion of the meeting and listen to the feedback without having to sit through the presentation or the question. So, you know, that option is available. Thank you, Jared. I'm going to open it up to the discussion amongst commission members. Please raise your hand and Jared will call you in order. I know Khalil has been uh, anticipating this discussion, so uh, I'll call on him first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. Uh, I attended both both meetings. They, as 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 the, the director said, they were marathon sessions. Uh, they lasted approximately, I would say, two and a half hours apiece, if not maybe a little bit more. Uh, I need to commend uh, DMF for the manner and how they listened to the participants. I thought that both both evenings were well run, giving the participants the opportunity. Uh, to offer 
their questions and to offer their comments. And, um, and I thought, I thought the, the, the participants, I thought it was a very positive meeting as far as the behavior of, uh, of those who attended and who uh, offered their comments and questions. Um, I thought they were, they were very compelling in their arguments from both sides. Once again, there's a conundrum. You know, we have the livelihood of the, of the, uh, of the right whale and we have the livelihood of the fishermen. And I do need to say I was really struck uh, and uh, moved very deeply by, by the comments of the fishermen uh, and their livelihoods. And, you know, uh, knowing that they're uh, on a slim margin for profitability of what they do. And, um, and it really struck me, you know, uh, that, that, they, that they're struggling. And, and, and once again, once again, another regulation might be put upon them. Uh, and and that, that's not gonna come without cost to them. And, um, and so I, I really was very, very moved by the comments from the fishermen, but also I understand the, the comments in the, uh, regarding the, uh, the, the right whale and the, the protective species status that they, that they have. Uh, so this really is a complicated issue one that's not going to be resolved easily, and uh, but I was really uh, I was really uh, very impressed with the way everybody uh, participated last evening, and and I just need to um, commend the DMF for that. Thank you thank, for allowing thank, me to present. Thank you, Khalil. Who's next, Jared? Mike Piernock. Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I listened in both nights. Uh, one question I do have, and, and it was pointed out that uh, this will be addressed separately. And, and it, the question is, uh, uh, when and how has to do with the economic impact that this will have on commercial fishermen? Has that estimate been uh, determined or established? And will there be any uh, relief to uh, the commercial fishermen as a result of these measures, um, you know, from a, I was, I, if I recall, there was one, maybe two people from a recreational standpoint that let, let's not forget they few, um, some of the public is using it just as subsistence fishing to, to get lobster. So, um, you know, there's that end of the spectrum too, but uh, w what's the process with that, Dan? Uh, how has that been looked at? Uh, is that looked at after the fact and what's the timing we did a great job with the CARES Act to, to help those that have been in need, but here's another instance where uh, there could be impacts and I just don't know how significant and what that dollar value would be. Thank you. Well, it's a good question, Mike. Um, obviously there's, uh, you know, DMF doesn't appropriate funds and um, I'm not really sure. I, 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 I couldn't even forecast if either the legislature and the governor or uh, the uh, or Congress uh, were to uh, allocate funds for re relief. About 16 years ago, there was a program to transition the lobsterman from uh, floating ground line to sinking ground line. And uh, Ted Kennedy came up with a bunch of money and, and uh, lobstermen all got vouchers to, um, to go to um, their, their gear supplier and, and replace their floating line and, and the floating line was recycled into like doormats. Um, but I, I don't, I haven't heard of any, of any interest to do this. Now, now Bob has a, um, has this grant and also we have some funds from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And Bob, why don't I let you speak to that about some of the, the uh, resources that we have to provide um, fishermen some nominal numbers of these breakaway devices. Sure, Dan, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have kind of a first, we have a grant in hand. Um, it's through Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. The funding comes from NOAA and the, the, this is directly related to helping the fishing industry transition over into kind of the weak fishing gear that are parts of this proposal, but also what, what we know is coming through the, the federal rulemaking process through the TRT. Um, we have a, 
it, it's, you know, for the scale of what needs to get done, it's fairly short money, but we're, you, you know, we're trying. We have a couple hundred thousand dollars to purchase gear. Uh, we po- purchased so far 400 coils of weak rope and 4,000 of the weak sleeves to distribute at no cost to the fishing industry. We realize that this is not going to cover the entire need. Um, in addition to that, we are, are looking for a uh, state appropriation. I, I don't know as to whether or not we'll get that, but we are trying to get an, an additional $200,000 uh, to uh, that'll be solely for purchasing additional um, rope and, um, and or contrivances to allow fishermen, help them transition and comply with the new rules relative to weak gear. Um, so that's, that, that's help, helping to defer the cost. But, you know, as Dan said, um, relative to financial relief, um, you know, we don't have anything in the books related to that. Uh, as Dan said, we don't appropriate funds. Yeah. And last night, the conversation centered on the financial impacts of the closure. And I've, I've never um, seen uh, any kind of funds that would be allocated for individuals who are impacted by the closure. Obviously, every lobsterman has his own business plan and his own way of fishing and his own seasonality. But the landings that actually come from state waters during the period of February through April, that which is left open in state waters, because as you know, much of the area from Situate all the way around in Nantucket is closed uh, during that time. It's under 2% of our annual um, landings. So, um, but that doesn't mean that there may not be an individual who found has a honey hole who's able to catch lobsters and and uh, sell it into a you know a, 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 a boutique market for maximum profit. I mean, it's it's never safe to to un, to um, underestimate um, how uh, you know somebody's business plan might be impacted. I don't want to do that, but when we look at it from ten thousand feet, uh, we're still talking about a very small percentage of the of the overall landings that do come in during those months of February, March, and April. Thank you. So has Bob got more to add or Aaron Burke, has she got anything to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add um, to give you a little additional context to this process is this is one of the most challenging things that we've, we've ever tried to navigate. Um, and so the, the timing of this rulemaking um, is very, as Dan indicated, is, is very much pointed at uh, trying to get this in the books before National Marine Fishery Service uh, publishes their next list of fisheries, because it's going for, in order for us to attain an incidental take permit, we need to have our fishery separated on its own, and we need to uh, get a, no, a negligible impact determination. And so the, the measures that we have here are ones that um, DMF is kind of, we point, you know, looked at in where areas where we still were exposed to risk above and beyond what was pr- proposed in the original uh, TRT conservation plan. And so the, the goal here is to try to eliminate that risk to obtain that uh, negligible impact determination from the service while at the, while, while at the same time trying to keep our fishermen on the water and, and, and achieve them the, the middle, the most the least amount of impact on their businesses possible. And so that was kind of the, the strategy here. Um, it's, you know, we're hopeful that uh, if implemented, this will be sufficient uh, to get us the, the negligible impact determination. We've had some, some encouraging discussions with National Marine Fishery Service preliminarily about these proposed regulations that uh, make us think that we would be successful if, if we get them. Um, and, it, and the only thing I would point out that Dan didn't mention is that, you know, our fear here is the, the alternative if we're not successful in obtaining this is that we will tur- turn the fate of our lobster fishery over to that of a, the decision of a federal judge, which, you know, I'm, I'm deathly afraid of. Uh, and, and, and I think um, I would much rather see DMF work with the industry to try to find these measures, I, I, albeit we know that they're, they're very painful. So, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Robert. Questions for Robert or any more discussion on this from commission members? Please raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, uh, Barry, thank you. Uh, I won't say too much, Ray, because 
a lot of thoughts that have to go into this, but uh, you know, what I think of it and what, who I represent. A little disappointed in my fellow fishermen from the North Shore for not participating in the two calls, but hopefully they're going to uh, send written comments. Uh, the only thing that I don't like is that Massachusetts has all the severe cuts. This time here, we're going to do some major surgery on the lobster fisheries in Massachusetts again, where the rest of this, uh, the zone of the, the range of the right whales gets to skate. And I'm disappointed in the feds not coming out with their plan, to maybe appease some of this lawsuit that's going on. So here we are out in left field by ourselves with no federal political support of any type trying to do something to help the whole right whale population. And these cuts are not really going to do anything for the right whales. I don't think personally, but everybody else is going to get a free ride again. And Massachusetts is going to bid a brunt of all the issues and problems with the right whales as usual. And it's just very disheartening for me. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Suki. Any other hands, Jared? I'm not seeing any further comments, Mr. Chair. So I presume we'll be discussing this agenda item at most every commission meeting, updates and whatnot. Well, actually, Ray, next month we're coming back to you with a formal recommendation on the items that were at last night's hearings. So the commission members, if they could... Um, invest the time to um, read the, the comments. We'll be, we'll be able to get the comments out to them right away. And then any recommendation memo, we'll make sure you get um, uh, yeah. prior to the, um, to the, a week before the, the commission business meeting. Dan, given the, um, the, the breadth of the comments, my plan moving forward um, is to place that on our proposed regulations website. I'll circulate that link to the commission members after this meeting and update it daily uh, as comments come in mm -hmm. so that folks can get a head start on reading some of this because, I mean, as I said earlier, there we have received about 400 written comments at this point, and I hear my email keep dinging throughout this meeting with more coming in. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, Jared. So if commission members have no more questions, we can move along here, but I'm still looking for an update on this, uh, uh, this special permit granted by NOAA. I'm sure commission members will want to be updated on that, on this incidental tag permit. Oh, right. Yes. And yes. The federal, and the federal plan. Yep. Agreed. Thank you. So let's move along here. Review of law enforcement subcommittee meeting. Who's going to run with this, Dan? Yeah, do you want me to take this? Yeah, Jared. Sure. I put together a couple slides. So um, let me just pull those up. Um, so, you know, this is probably one of my favorite subcommittee meetings to work on. I, I think we get a lot of uh, good feedback, good discussion. Uh, you know, several years back, we, we amended the fines and penalties through this subcommittee for marine fisheries violations. So, you know, a lot of good work gets done uh, through these. So we met on November 19th. Uh, you can see the agenda in front of you. I'm gonna go through and kind of briefly summarize uh, some of the key takeaways from these agenda items. Uh, some things you'll probably be seeing coming back in regulation proposals um, for public hearing and the, you know, early in 2021 and some other things that we're gonna kind of continue to work on and review. So, um, you know, the first discussion item was quota managed species. Um, we discussed the uh, canal closure to commercial striped bass fishing this year. Uh, MEP gave us some pretty positive feedback on that. They felt that not only did it enhance enforcement, it also resulted in fewer erroneous tips regarding poaching. Um, we discussed the new to tog tagging program that was implemented this year, and uh, we we're asked to do some additional education and outreach on how to tag the to tog 
specifically um, a video. And uh, there was also continued discussion about the use of dual commercial and for hire permit holders using their commercial permits to take patrons out and avoid more restrictive recreational regulations using their patrons as commercial crew. Um, this is something we've addressed through regulation, but continues to be a problem uh, among certain individuals in the for hire fleet. I'm not gonna say it's a widespread problem. It's a pretty discreet problem, I think. Um, and there was some discussion that if we're gonna take action on permits for these violations that we develop an affidavit that underscores um, these regulations so that when they are brought to an adjudicatory proceeding, that there is an administrative record uh, record documenting that they know um, that that is not authorized. Um, there was some discussion about gear marking. Um, I believe back in 2019, the issue of the go deep buoys in the lobster fishery was raised and we had intended to discuss that further with MLA and the pandemic kind of threw that off our radar. Um, they're popular to be used because their functionality, their ability to, uh, you know, sustain um, being hit by vessels and, and um, the, the problem is, is that with these, they're often not or cannot be fished with the required flags and sticks. So there are some gear marking issues there that need to be resolved. And we'll, we'll go back and continue to discuss that with the lobster industry. Um, Lieutenant Cohen, who works on the South Coast where there's a lot of uh, mixed trap gear fisheries, lobster trap, fish pots, scuff and black sea bass and conch pots. Um, he raised the issue that it's, it's difficult to um, tell what the gear is at the surface and that there are some individuals down there that may be rigging uh, their lot fish pots as lobster traps because they don't have a fish pot permit and then potentially keeping the fish taken in those fish pots um, and that it, to improve the enforcement of the uh, gear types, he'd like to see some type of surface marking requirement such as a uh, tie wrap, a certain colored tie wrap right below the buoy to um, demonstrate that it's a lobster trap or it's a scuff trap or it's a black sea bass trap. And then when they go to enforce the, the, the gear components and, and the catch from that, that they could do it more uh, efficiently and readily. Uh, then there, there was also raised that there are some uh, trap fishermen who are marking their buoys with magic marker. The magic marker wears off and it becomes impossible to identify that gear and they'd prefer painting or um, you know, other, other marking requirements and to eliminate the use of magic markers. Um, we discussed some lobster fishery issues, uh, particularly creating more uniformity in the regulations. Uh, I mean, he was seeking a clear definition of the LMA v one VNOT requirement. The current zero tolerance definition allows for too much discretion. Uh, we've discussed this, uh, Dan in particular, with the lobster board at ASMFC, and uh, Maine has been an impediment to changing that on the. Um, on the um, interstate level, but we will continue to try to help establish a clearer definition for that. Uh, additionally, uh, they asked, MEP asked us to adopt a six and three quarters inch minimum carapace size standard for the state waters portion of the Outer Cape LMA to match the federal rules. In turn, this would then create a, the, the state waters portion of the L of the Outer Cape LMA is the only area that does not have a uh, maximum size. The federal portion of that LMA has a six and three quarters inch maximum size, so that would match the federal rules. Uh, it would also then create a maximum carapace size standard for dealers of six and three quarters inches. Uh, so that's something that we can consider moving forward to public hearing. Um, then we discussed a couple other matters uh, with the removal of the exemptions for circle hooks and, and for striped bass and codifying, recodifying that rule uh, this winter. There was um, 
interest in us addressing the incidental catch of striped bass by non-circle hooks. So if you're fishing for bluefish and you catch a striped bass using a J hook, can you keep that striped bass? So that's something that we need to consider when we go out to public hearing this winter. Um, there's been a lot of uh, concern uh, statewide, but all but mid Cape has really been uh, where this is an issue that there's a shellfish arriving at primary buyers that are untagged. Um, you know, the reason for this may vary, but, but our fear and, and, and what we have seen happening is that um, the, the shellfish may be harvested from a closed area and the shellfish fisherman arrives at the dealer um, and tags it coming from an open area. And that presents a pretty substantial public health issue uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, in instances where this occurs, uh, we need to start pushing back on the dealers who are accepting this product untagged, um, perhaps beginning with a letter to them, notifying them that they cannot accept untagged shellfish, um, and then also following through with permit sanctions on primary buyer authorizations if they continue to do so. Um, well, minimum size management was another issue. There, you know, there were several outstanding violations in the past couple of years where thousands of pieces of undersized wealth were observed coming in. There were also several recent incidents uh, that are pretty outstanding as well. Um, you know, so there was a discussion about pursuing uh, these cases at the dealer level, which MEP has been doing, and um, you know, DMF pursuing wholesale dealer permit and primary buyer permit revocations and sanctions in instances when this does occur. Uh, the black sea bass pot allocation was discussed. Uh, we, we allowed 200 traps to be fished uh, with trip limits of 400 um, pounds per trip. There was some interest in potentially reducing that. And there was also some discussion that this may also come out in the um, incidental take permit application for turtles and the regulations that follow that as we have to try to address uh, turtle takes. Um, continuing interest from DMF to better define the difference between marine debris and impact gear and intact gear to encourage the removal of derelict gear from waters and beaches. Um, and uh, you know, the past couple of years, two years ago, I believe, maybe it was 2019, there was a uh, violation of Rhode Island striped bass regulations by a Rhode Island resident who was a Massachusetts commercial permit holder. Uh, they, were, they were not a Rhode Island commercial permit holder, but they were found in possession of a uh, 34-inch or greater uh, fish, which were legal to be sold in Massachusetts in that year. Um, and in quantities in excess of, you know, the one fish recreational limit. And the understanding was that, you know, this fish would, was ultimately destined for New Bedford. Um, however, because the case occurred in Rhode Island and we had very little legal capability to sanction the permits of this permit holder. And we continue to seek a tool to do that. So there was some discussion about the interstate wildlife compact and whether that would provide us with such a tool or if this could be something that was pursued through the ASMFC. So those are the big uh, takeaways from that law enforcement subcommittee meeting. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions on that at this time. Questions from commission members for Jared, please. Suki? Yeah, just to point of information on the buoys, the SpongeX uh, Corporation was a ma ma major manufacturer of styrofoam buoys and they've closed up. So a Chinese company is trying to get into the market, I think, but you're going to see a lot more go deeds because I think that's pretty much the only option, right? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we can make something work there. Um, it just it's going to require a tweak of the regulations in one way or another. I'm not seeing any other questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, let's move it along then. Up 
updates from the joint ASMFC Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council meeting. I presume Nicola is going to take this. I am. Thanks, Ray. Um, so this is more of a preview, really, of um, the meeting next week between the Atlantic States Commission um, with the Mid-Atlantic Council. They're meeting jointly on fluke scup sea bass and bluefish. So I'm just going to touch on expected final actions um, next week. Um, so the first is setting of the recreational specifications for all four species. Typically at this meeting in December, um, the board and council are looking at um, preliminary January to August landings for those species and comparing them to the recreational harvest limit for the coming year and deciding whether um, restrictions or, or liberalizations are necessary for each species. However, this year we're of course in a, a challenging situation due to um, the, the cancellation or suspension of MRIP in many states along the coast this year under um, COVID uh, safety precautions. And what we're hearing from NOAA Fisheries at this point is that annual coastwide harvest estimates um, for the year are unlikely to be available until the spring of 2021. And that we might not ever have, you know, state and species uh, wave specific estimates. Um, so at this point, the council and board don't really have um, much to go on in terms of what the harvest levels were this year. Um, and largely for that reason, the staff's recommendation is for status quo measures for all four species. Um, uh, if, regarding sea bass, um, we'll have to see if we can make that um, small change to the season that the um, recreational fishery often likes to see where we start the fishery on a Saturday. Um, the early indication from NOAA fisheries is that they, they don't support allowing states to make any changes to the season um, because there's um, a likely possibility that um, the recreational annual catch limit um, and maybe even the ABC is going to be exceeded for sea bass. So they'd like to not see any additional uncertainty added to the situation, um, but we'll push back on that to see if we can um, get that Saturday start to the fishery. Um, and then the other um, final action, we'll be looking at the commercial black sea bass reallocation amendment as Dan alluded to previously. Um, <clears throat> this is similar to, to fluke. Um, we'll be looking for um, an option that will redistribute some of the black sea bass coastwide quota um, to states based on you know, changing distribution of the resource. Um, so I expect that that's going to be a difficult um, discussion between the, the council and the board, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. So that, that was it for me. Thank you, Nicola. Questions for Nicola? Mike Beard, Nook. Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Nicola. Well done. Uh, thank you for trying to uh, address that May 18th start date. Uh, there's been many questions thrown my way concerning that. Uh, the fact that we were able to get uh, um, a four higher season and bag limit that extended into October, uh, does, is that on the table again to consider such next year? And the, in addition, since Many are filing EVTRs. Is there enough data and information there uh, that could provide some insight into landings? I, I just know uh, overall, it's tough for us to have used up that quota. I think it was through October because of weather conditions. So uh, I'm just curious to how it ended up or, or do you have that information or when will you have it? Um, regarding the season, um, the change that we made for the for hire fleet um, was specific to this year. So if we have status quo regulations, it would be going back to the May 18th start and September 8th closure for all modes. Um, we had certainly hoped that getting that those additional days in October for the for hire fleet this year um, would provide us with some you know, data. Um, on how the catch rates change as we move further into um, wave five. That's really information that we need to get a longer season overall for, for sea bass. Um, 
you know, overall, the for hire fleet is a, is a small component of the recreational harvest for sea bass. So we may be able to get some additional information from EVTRs that are submitted. Um, uh, but I, we have not looked at it yet. Um, and I, well, I, I guess I don't know what a timeline would be to get that from NIMS before, um, before asking for it. Correct me, Nicola, but wave five, you, you haven't even seen wave five numbers yet, have you? It usually mm -hmm. takes, what, six weeks? Right. And at this point, the only numbers that are being released from nymphs are effort numbers for all species. There, there are no harvest estimates for 2020 available at this point. Um, or all, the, the, the effort numbers for the first four waves show that there was a significant decline in, in for higher effort. Um, shore and private mode didn't see as much change. Um, or uh, increased on private vessels, I believe, and decreased a bit on shore, but there was a decline in, in for higher um, effort as uh, would be anticipated based on, you know, various closures that occurred um, or, or, you know, restrictions on capacity and everything else. Um, so we really don't have any harvest estimates yet. One, one last question. question. Any more questions for Nicola? Can I add, I have another question? Yes, Michael. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nicola. Uh, so it sounds as though status quo, which makes a lot of sense with the lack of MRIP numbers, uh, is that more likely to occur or is that more up in the air? I think it's, it's likely to occur. Um, whether or not we can just tweak the season um, is unknown, but I think overall status quo is very likely. Um, you have to go back to last year when it was also status quo. And the reason for that was because, um, you know, the new MREP harvest numbers were showing that we were well above the harvest limit. And in normal circumstances, we would have been saying, oh, we need to take a cut. But at the same time, the council and commission are looking at changing the commercial recreational allocations to respond to the MREP um, numbers and that hasn't happened. That hasn't been finalized yet. That's um, likely going. A document's going to be released for public co comment next week. Um, <clears throat> so, so NOAA Fisheries has, has essentially said, "Okay, we'll we'll let you stay status quo, even though it's projected to result in an overage, um, as long as progress on this other amendment continues, and we're giving you some time to kind of um, adapt the management to these new MRIP numbers." So that, that's kind of like that, that situation continues into this year um, and with the added difficulty of not having 2020 harvest numbers. Thank you. Any other questions for Nicola? Not seeing any further questions, Mr. Chair. Then we're gonna move along to 5D, 2021 business meeting schedule. Sure, I'm just gonna pull up a couple proposed dates right now. Um, so that's what I've uh, isolated as dates that um, work uh, with the council and commission schedules of uh, Thursday, February 18th, Thursday, March 18th, either Thursday, April 15th or April 22nd, Thursday, May 13th or May 20th and June 17th. So I'll circulate those dates with all the commission members. Uh, if you have any conflicts, let me know. I'll try to work around them as best as possible. Uh, and that would be in addition to the already scheduled January 7th meeting. Thank you, Jared. So you will send that to commission <laughs> members and they will reach out to you. Yes. Thank you. Let's move uh, along. We're behind schedule here. Mr. Chair, before we move to the uh, presentation, uh, I know that uh, Bill Amaru had a, a question for uh, our staff, and we've made Catherine Ford available, but her time today is fairly limited. So if we could uh, move to Bill's question uh, before um, the presentation on dissolved oxygen, uh, I think that would work for okay. us. Okay, so I'm gonna recognize Bill Amaru. Bill, you have a question for Catherine Ford? Well. Yes, I'll be very brief. This won't take long. It's it has to do with the uh, topic of dredging in estuarian waters that we discussed at our last meeting. 
estuary and waters where dredging will be taking place oh, yeah. for clear channel. Yeah, yeah th it's mainly to, to get a sense of uh, what requirements are placed on the vision uh, for getting started on a review of, of the species that we're concerned about, uh, whether or not the division will take up a, uh, an active part uh, or whether we have to go outside channels to get funding for the kind of work that we're talking about doing. And, and Catherine was gonna help to uh, elucidate the situation for us. Catherine Ford, you recognize me. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm here, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you, Bill, for raising this issue. Um, Bill and I spoke earlier this week and um, I think the question is along the lines of um, doing a similar type of study uh, that was done in the 1960s for the Estrine Report series. These studies did continue. Um, some of them were done as recently as the 1990s. Um, more recently than that, in Pleasant Bay, um, Pleasant Bay um, non-governmental organizations, friends groups in Pleasant Bay funded a study of Pleasant Bay that DMF participated on a steering committee and um, provided technical advice to. Um, and recently, I believe Wellfleet has also asked for a similar type of sort of more ecosystem-based assessment of, of a water body. So I think that's kind of the, the direction of the, the request that, that DMF fund these um, you know, estuarine water body studies again, um, with one of them um, being the water bodies in Orleans. Bill, am I characterizing that okay for you? Yes, you're characterizing it, but it doesn't get us any closer to uh, understanding where uh, the process is gonna begin. Right. I think that's a question to you, Catherine. Um, I think I'll defer to Director McKiernan on that about how, um, you know, we might orient our priorities around doing estuary surveys again or, or doing surveys in a specific estuary. Yeah, uh, thanks, Catherine. What's, what's interesting, and um, I guess this is history day at DMF, um, when the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission was formed in, in 1960 to look at the problems of marine fisheries, one of the recommendations was to do a bunch of estuarine studies, which uh, was accomplished. So as Catherine mentioned, um, there was funding from the, uh, well, those were accomplished. And, and it's my understanding that there was uh, substantial uh, funding from the legislature uh, to get those done um, over time. And uh, we were able to expand our ranks um, of, of, of biologists and, and DMF's biologists have to fund all those. Uh, at this point, uh, we we don't have the resources to uh, to take on any any of that work. Uh, it's something we could discuss with with our, uh, our folks uh, who deal with, uh, with the governor's office and the legislature. Um, but it's it. I mean, I I think Bill, what you're what you're ultimately looking for is not an estuarine study, but is a kind of a presence absence of, of winter flounder to determine if it's really necessary to continue um, or to keep the uh, time of year windows as, as rigid as they are to protect yes, winter you, flounder. You characterize it better than I did. That's yeah. exactly what we're looking for. And, and so um, I, I guess what I'll do is I'll huddle with, with the, the staff um, and, and try to see if there's a way that we can chip away at some of these estuaries. Catherine mentioned at last month's meeting that the idea of um, these eDNA studies to uh, detect the presence right. of, of, of winter flounder. Um, we know that winter flounder has uh, shifted in its distribution. Everybody knows we, we used to have a robust um, dragger fishery for, for black backs uh, beginning November 1. And even when that area opens, uh, very few boats show up. So it's not, it's not um, what it used to be. So uh, I guess I'd be asking for more time to huddle with, with my staff to see um, what's the best approach. Is it to look for legislative funding? Is it to, to try to find outside funding? Um, because it's, I'm not sure we need to do a full blown estuarine study, although, I bet many on our staff would love us to do that because when they fall back on those estuarine reports, many of them uh, are almost uh, 60 years old now. Well, the one so, I think about uh, that I've used 
to formulate my thinking on this is a study that was actually conducted by two scientists and Phil Coates mm -hmm. back in 1967. I hope Phil's still listening and he'll remember that very, very well. He was a young man at the time and they did a tremendous uh, research project on the uh, Pleasant Bay estuary. And in it, he talks quite a bit about the presence of large numbers of black back flounder, as well as other species that we don't see there anymore. Uh, so I'm not asking for something as, as dynamic as that. I am actually specifically asking for a study that would take place in, in the upper reaches of Pleasant Bay, where mm -hmm. we're planning on dredging, where we're applying for permits now, and the Nauset uh, estuary. Two very much changed bodies of water since the, uh, the mid-60s, or even the 90s. Yeah. So, Bill, this is Ray. So, as I'm understanding this, you're looking more for a timeline on this when, when we as a commission could react. Yes. Well, for the point of, of this discussion, it is the commission that right. we're talking about. I'd like to see the the commission's um, support, and uh, hopefully, that along with the DNFs possibilities. I mean, we do have a division of, of research over in uh, Dartmouth, and we have people like Dr. Cadron uh, with a tremendous amount of knowledge about how we can do fairly robust studies in a fairly short period of time using small trawls and sains, beach sains. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see him come on board. I, I'm waiting to talk a little bit more to, to Deanne about where I should go with this. I don't want to overstep my authority, certainly, but right. I want to be uh, aggressive as, as I can be and try to get something accomplished. Our dredging project is hopefully going to happen in the next several years. Mm -hmm. Well, let me pledge to you, Bill, to um, huddle with my staff and um, get you an answer at the uh, January meeting of, of what our strategy would be going forward. Great. Okay. Okay. Are you good with that, Bill? Very good. Okay. Can we move along here? We're way behind schedule. We have a presentation coming up. It's going to take a half hour, folks. Yes, sir. Uh, Tracy, you've been made a co-host. You should be able to share your screen. Dan, do you want to give some introductory remarks? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, thanks. Uh, Tracy Pugh, uh, Dr. Tracy Pugh reports to Bob Glenn. She oversees our invertebrate uh, species investigations. Um, she's done some amazing work and was featured on National Public Radio for this particular uh, project. And uh, it's a great example of a cooperative research project done uh, with the commercial fishing industry to collect environmental data. And uh, it's one of the coolest things that, that I think we've done in a long time. And I'm really looking forward for, for Tracy to present this today. Tracy, the floor you. is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Dan. Um, I, hopefully everybody can hear me. Somebody squawk if you can't. Um, so I'm going to talk about the um, dissolved oxygen monitoring that we're doing. This is collaborative work um, and definitely heavily reliant on these collaborations, um, both with the department level GIS team, um, with the Mass Lobstermen's Foundation, and um, with the Center for Coastal Studies and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So in order to um, sort of set the stage here, we have to go back to last fall when um, in mid to late September, we started receiving phone calls from lobstermen in Cape Cod Bay that they were hauling up um, anywhere from dozens to uh, hundreds of dead lobsters in their traps. They were also seeing dead crabs and fin fish at the same time. And the time period was pretty concentrated right around September 20th to the 24th or so. Uh, we also received a report from a dragger who worked in the area um, of much higher incidence of dead scallops in his catch than would be, you know, remotely normal. And again, these were all focused in sort of the southern, the southwestern corner of Cape Cod Bay, roughly from east of the canal over to sort of the Barnstable Harbor entrance area. And it seemed to be um, isolated within the depth range of about 30 to 80 feet. Um, so we were taken totally by surprise here and we really didn't have a good idea of what could be going on. So we really scrambled some staff to try to start learning about this and trying to figure out, um, you know, what could be happening here. So, you know, we looked into um, getting folks on the water to take some water quality readings. Um, we had a lot of assistance from Center for Coastal Studies with this. We sent uh, some of our biologists out aboard the commercial boats working in the area so that we could directly observe the catch as they were seeing it. We also put some divers in the water so that we could do direct observations of the bottom. Um, 
we took a lot of time and uh, spent a lot of effort looking into the location and timing of um, some of the mosquito spray events um, you know, mosquito, mosquito control programs. We also took some of the dead lobsters and fish and sent them away for uh, pathology analysis. And we spent a lot of time collecting data on the oceanographic and weather patterns in the area at the time. Um, as we were going through this, essentially the, the water quality results really became sort of the smoking gun here. And um, what we were seeing is evidence for some pretty severe hypoxia. Um, hypoxia just means that there's not enough oxygen in the water. And the readings we were getting back in the area um, were extremely low. Um, so we're talking about dissolved oxygen here and levels less than one milligram per liter in our samples. Uh, these levels are definitely lethal to lobsters um, after about 48 hours. So it, it became pretty obvious of what the major problem was is a severe hypoxia. And when we looked at all of the data we collected from last fall, uh, you know, we can kind of map it out. And you know, a, a relatively surprisingly large portion of the southern portion of Cape Cod Bay is experiencing or was experiencing this low dissolved oxygen. And if you look at the map here, anything um, that's shaded in the yellow is what we would consider to be a low dissolved oxygen. And this is um, less than six. Uh, the orange here is what we would consider to be hypoxic, uh, less than four milligrams per liter. And in the red here is what we would consider to be severely hypoxic, um, or you know, if we can euphemism, this is, the, this is the bad area, this is the dead zone, and that's less than two milligrams per liter. Um, so just real quickly, how does hypoxia happen or form? Uh, essentially, it's the result of large inputs of nutrients coming into the water. Those nutrients essentially form the basis to allow uh, a huge increase in organic material, so algal blooms. Then when that algae dies, it sinks to the bottom and decomposes. The process of decomposition uses oxygen from those bottom waters. And what happens is when you have a, a stratified water column or a very layered water column, um, the surface waters are prevented from mixing down and replenishing that oxygen in those bottom waters. So if you can't get that mixing over time, the decomposition sucks up all the dissolved oxygen and it, the result is that you get this hypoxic condition. Um, Generally, mobile animals like lobsters, crabs, fish can move away from hypoxia uh, to avoid those conditions. But anything that's um, you know, less mobile or obviously stuck in traps uh, cannot move and it, it will kill them. Uh, one of the most sort of infamous dead zones or hypoxic areas in the US is this uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. We've probably all heard of this. Um, this is the result of massive amounts of nutrients that come down through the Mississippi are released into the Gulf of Mexico um, and um, cause these uh, huge dead zone. This is just the extent of the 2019 version of the dead zone. So our concern here was whether or not Cape Cod Bay could be going this route. Um, so in, in doing all of the homework that we did last year to try to understand this, we discovered that um, it, it actually happens annually. So seasonal declines of dissolved oxygen in Cape Cod Bay is a relatively normal event. Um, what happens is that uh, for most of the year, Cape Cod Bay is essentially downstream or down current of this heavy, heavily populated coastline, uh, which means all of the nutrient inputs come downstream into Cape Cod Bay. Um, but into the summer and fall, there's some changes in water circulation patterns that tend to then isolate Cape Cod Bay from the rest of Massachusetts Bay. And if you look at the, the maps here um, on the bottom left shows sort of a, a, what the spring water flow conditions look like. And you can see there's a very strong um, current that, that brings uh, nutrients down into Cape Cod Bay in the spring. Um, but then in the summer, what happens is the, um, the water circulation patterns change. And instead of coming down into Cape Cod Bay, the water currents are sort of deflected off to the east and end up going out and around the backside. And what happens within Cape Cod Bay here is you get these little sort of gyres that set up that are sort of relatively isolated. And this one down here that sets up in the southwestern corner just happens to coincide with the area where we saw all of the um, hypoxic conditions. Uh, the other characteristic of Cape Cod Bay that sort of sets the stage for this sort of um, declining oxygen is a very strong thermal stratification that tends to set up in the summer and then persist into the fall. 
And again, stratification is just layering of the water column. And these, the temperature data here in this graph shows, you know, it, so this is the surface. Um, and at the surface, we've got 18 degrees centigrade, which is about, uh, I think it's 64 uh, Fahrenheit. And it's very warm all the way down to about 60 feet in depth. And all of a sudden there's this drastic change. So down on the bottom, um, you're looking at maybe eight degrees centigrade. So it's a huge temperature change um, over a, a, a relatively narrow depth range. And so this is a very strong thermal stratification. And this kind of setup is what prevents these warm surface waters uh, from mixing down to the bottom. So the question really is, you know, are we looking at the southern portion of Cape Cod Bay developing into sort of a new annual dead zone? As, as we all know, the Gulf of Maine is warming more rapidly than many other portions of the world's oceans. Um, warmer waters tend to increase the potential for hypoxic conditions to develop. Um, warmer waters hold less oxygen. They tend to further stratify the water column. They increase the biological productivity, so more stuff that's going to die off eventually and decompose. And then it also increases the sediment oxygen demand. So there's, there's more demand for the oxygen to, to break down all that material. Um, so in order to really ask or answer this question as to the future of Cape Cod Bay, we really need a better understanding of what's driving these processes um, and um, try to figure out whether or not 2019 was an anomaly, whether it was gonna stand out or if it was gonna become more normal. And just to um, give a little bit of information here. So the graphics that just popped up on the right here, um, this is chlorophyll A data and chlorophyll A can be used as a proxy for um, algae, al algal biomass. If you look at this top, this is September um, average uh, chlorophyll A over the time period of 2010 to 2018. When you look at the bottom, this is the September values in 2019. And you can see the huge difference that makes 2019 look really different from this time series, time series average, um, suggesting that in 2019, there was an awful lot of algal biomass in the system here. So um, in order to really understand this and, and whether or not you know, what we saw in 2019 is sort of gonna become a new normal, we really needed to develop some new monitoring efforts to try to get a handle on this and to try to, try to get enough data to inform us. Um, the first of these new monitoring efforts is the uh, creation of the Cape Cod Bay study fleet. Um, so in 2019, when all this happened, the fishermen in the area expressed very strong interest in getting involved and helping us to um, monitor the situation moving forward. And the Lobster Foundation of Massachusetts was um, able to secure funding through a state grant program this year, this spring, that was a, that sort of set up the um, the study fleet. So the funding was used to purchase um, data loggers and data deck boxes to outfit five vessels as sort of monitoring platforms. So the, the data logger, which is this black thing here, um, is uh, records dissolved oxygen and temperature. And then the data deck box here, each boat has one of these. And the logger is attached to the traps. Uh, they go down with the traps record these um, dissolved oxygen and temperature every 15 minutes. Then when the traps are hauled, uh, the logger just automatically uh, through a Bluetooth connection detects the uh, data box, downloads the data, the traps are set back, the logger goes back in the water. And then the, the deck box here sends the data through a cell phone signal um, to a server on land. So it's a super efficient system and it, it lets us get a lot of, uh, a lot of information in place, uh, which is really nice. So the fleet was able to deploy these loggers this July. And this chart here just gives you a good idea of um, sort of where all of the loggers were deployed. Um, these are through the end of September is what these uh, locations show. So you can see we've got pretty good coverage in this Southwest corner of the bay here. And we've also got some coverage up here in the northeastern corner. So the other portion of this work um, is collaborative work with the Center for Coastal Studies, uh, a couple of researchers at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and uh, again with the department level GIS team. And we were able to secure additional money to work on this through the National Sea Grant American Lobster uh, Research Initiative. 
with the goals being to increase our ability to detect and hopefully predict the potential onset of hypoxia, and then also to figure out a way of efficiently alerting the commercial lobster fleet and other stakeholders that the conditions are changing so that we can protect the fishery resources. So this work focuses on, um, again, water quality data collection, but also some data mining. So looking into historical data sets um, to try to figure out what things looked like in the past. Um, oceanographic modeling, some near time or near real time mapping. Um, so we're trying to develop some fancy maps that let us um, look at the data on a, on a near real time basis. And then also integrating some catch monitoring um, so that we can try to understand how the lobsters are reacting to these changing environmental conditions. So Center for Coastal Studies already has an existing monitoring program in Cape Cod Bay. Um, they monitor three stations specifically for MWRA, and then they have an additional nine stations um, and they, they do the monitoring work monthly. So this work is adding an additional uh, roughly six stations to their monthly um, sampling. And then what we're gonna do is look at, um, so we will monitor the data coming in from the study fleet. And as soon as we start to see the conditions sort of declining that, that dissolved oxygen coming down, that will be the signal to initiate some of these high resolution transect sampling. So, the, coast, the CCS will focus sort of on the southern portion here with these um, north-south transects for high resolution sampling, with the idea being to get a better idea of sort of the spatial extent of these hypoxic conditions. Center for Coastal Studies um, sampling is a little different from the, the study fleet. Um, the study fleet has, um, is taking one, um, one sort of point rating right on the bottom the Center for Coastal Studies instrumentation allows them to take samples throughout the entire water column, so from the surface all the way down. And the data they'll collect is dissolved oxygen, temperature, chlorophyll, uh, and a few other things. So uh, don't, don't strain your eyes trying to figure out what all this says. Uh, I just want to illustrate that in 2020, we were very successful and collected a whole lot of data. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I do want to point out some sort of um, uh, important uh, things that we learned with all of these new data. So um, this kind of gives you an idea of, of what we're trying to work towards with the mapping. Um, what you can see here is the spatial extent of the study fleet and um, the color coding of the values that are coming back. Um, so I, I blew the legend up here real big just again to get everybody on the right page. Um, essentially, if it's green or blue, it's normal. Yellow is uh, low, orange is hypoxic, and red is really bad. Um, and essentially, each one of these data points is one of those 15 minute readings. Um, don't pay any attention to the size of these points. The size changes just so that we can visualize um, multiple points stacked on top of each other. Um, but what I really want you to look at here is sort of the spatial extent of the data that we're getting in, and then a couple of trends. So firstly, um, you know, we are seeing the, the yellow values, which indicates low dissolved oxygen, um, pretty widespread throughout the August through October time period. And um, so a lot of the loggers in the south southwest region uh, were detecting um, hypoxia and severe hypoxia. So down here in the um, September map, um, this is the southwestern portion where you can see a lot of the orange and red dots po popping up. Um, one caveat here, um, which is why I'm calling this pre-QC data. So we, we have not yet filtered out all of the sort of the noise and the um, erroneous readings here. So for example, this uh, logger up here in Provincetown is coming back with a severe reading. We think that this is a erroneous reading. Um, probably something like a piece of algae was blocking that sensor briefly and it came back with a, a very low reading, but we don't think that the Provincetown area actually experienced any hypoxic conditions. Um, you can see it happened again once in September, but all of the other readings were fine. Um, and the same thing happened over here in, in the Manomet area. We think that this is an erroneous reading. Um, so we have some improvements we need to make to this system. Um, what we're gonna try to get to is probably, instead of trying to visualize every single reading, we'll probably try to look at it on like a six hour average we think that'll be more informative. So um, if you look at some of the study fleet data, I've selected the Sagamore uh, region 
for the, uh, the loggers here. And if you're not familiar with Sagamore, uh, the map down here on the bottom, here's the Cape Cod Canal at the very bottom of the screen. So the Sagamore region is immediately north of the Cape Cod Canal. Um, and this data set is actually nice and clean. Um, it's one of the easiest ones to, um, to deal with in terms of there's not a lot of um, errors in here. So the dissolved oxygen is shown in blue, temperature is shown in orange here, and we're just going to go through the dissolved oxygen trends real quickly here, because there is, um, there's some pretty good signals here. So the first thing we see is um, starting from about mid-August through the first half of September, all five loggers are showing a really strong signal of declining dissolved oxygen, um, reaching down into the levels, particularly in this bottom one down here, um, of hypoxic conditions. So um, after that, we had a brief improvement period in about the middle of September or so, where we saw a pretty quick uh, improvement in dissolved oxygen. Um, but then we saw another decline. This took place sort of early October area um, before it did improve again. And then sort of in mid to late October, we get this weird little blip where, um, you know, four of the five loggers picked up this decline signal. Um, so, you know, we are seeing a lot of dynamics in in what the dissolved oxygen is doing. So um, with the Center for Coastal Studies survey results, the, the decline that we saw in the fleet loggers in August is what initiated the transect sampling. So we saw it was coming down and we knew it was time to get out there. Center for Coastal Studies did these surveys roughly weekly uh, and depending on which boat they had and what the weather conditions were, you know, were able to accomplish more or less depending on the day. So the first day they got out, they got one transect done. This is August 31st. Um, the color coding is the same as what you've been looking at. And you can see here that the severely hypoxic waters um, is, is in this sort of 60 to 75 foot depth range here. Uh, a roughly a week later, September 3rd, you can see the severely hypoxic mass has shifted to the south into much shallower waters. So we're in about 30 to 50 feet here. A week later, it's still in that shallow southernmost portion of the bay. And then um, the week of, uh, on September 16th, now we see the mass has shifted north um, out here into deeper waters. So we're looking at it in 70 to 90 feet of water here. And the little red box over here, I, I, I put this in because this is actually the only reports we got this year of dead lobsters occurred in this little red box area during the time period, uh, the gear was fishing from the 16th to the 24th. So, so we know that something bad happened in the area of that little red box. Um, but the next time the Center for Coastal Studies got out on the 24th, we saw a massive improvement throughout the area. So um, all of these stations are now reading with normal oxygen levels. Um, but again, you can see the little red box here is, this is the region where we had the dead lobster reports. Um, so, at some point in time, that hypoxic water mass must have shifted over this region here. So um, with seeing all of this, the data coming from the Center for Coastal Studies and, and the variation that we're seeing with the city's fleet data, we, we know that this dissolved oxygen, this, this hypoxic water mass is moving around. And the best way that I've found to sort of conceptualize this and think about it is to, is I call it the blob. Um, so, <laughs> The blob, I, I went with this because it is kind of a, a pretty cohesive water mass that it's best to think about it in three dimensions. So um, it, it's this cohesive mass. Uh, it's generally located very close to the bottom and it, it does shift around. So we think that the shifting is being driven by um, upwelling and downwelling events that are wind driven. So that when we get a strong period of northerlies, uh, the northerlies push, push the surface waters towards the Southern shoreline which creates a downwelling condition along that shoreline. The downwelling then pushes the blob out away from shore. Whereas if we have southerly winds, the southerlies are pushing the surface water away from the shoreline, which sort of allows the bottom water to come in and produces an upwelling. And that's what brings the blob in closer to the shoreline. So if we go back again and have a look at the Center for Coastal Studies transects, you can see, you know, again, the, the red dots here, the blob is inshore. And we're going to take a closer look at, at transects four and five here, which I have labeled in the, in the chart here. And again, with the Center for Coastal Studies data, what they're able to do is take an entire water column profile. So we're, we're, that's going to allow us to look at this in three dimensions. So if we look at transect line four here, 
with their water column profile. So think of this as we just took a slice and we're looking at the, the water from the surface down to the depth. So on these charts here, uh, the top one is temperature, the bottom one is dissolved oxygen. This is essentially the distance from shoreline. So this is, you know, this is shore, this is moving north away from the shoreline. And then this is the depth on the vertical axis here. So um, the first thing you can really see here is with the temperature, um, you can see that really strong thermal stratification, extremely warm surface waters uh, and much, much cooler bottom waters. And then with the dissolved oxygen, what you're looking at here is, is anything from like the green into these warmer colors, this is the severely hypoxic range. And so you can really see the blob here in its you know, height dimensions. So that you can see the minimum is right on the bottom um, and it's about a kilometer offshore here. And the top of the blob, so the, the top of the yellowy green here uh, is about six and a half feet off the bottom. And it, it extends it out another kilometer or another half a mile offshore. So the, the whole extent of this thing, um, you know, both vertically and then offshore is not small. Uh, if we shift one transect line over to the east, you can see it looks a little bit different over here. You still see the strong thermal, uh, the strong stratification in the thermal signal here. Um, but what we look at here, now the blob looks like it's up off the bottom a little bit here, and it looks a little bit smaller here. Um, it doesn't quite extend as far into the, in the north-south direction as it did in the western transect. So you really get an idea of sort of how this thing looks um, in, in three dimensions when you use the water column data along with the transects. If we go look at, again at the September 16th where it's now been pushed offshore, um, you can see from the vertical profile, this, this warm surface water has now been mixed down near the shoreline. So that warm water is, is now down at the, at the bottom close to shore. And you can see here, the blob has been pushed way offshore. So we're six kilometers from the shoreline here now where that, that DO minimum is. Um, and this is the result of northerlies and that downwelling I talked about. Uh, what we think happened here is the September 18th through the 23rd or so, there was a period of pretty strong north and northeasterly winds. Um, this is the, the buoy data um, of wave heights. And you can see uh, we had this sort of extended period of like three to six foot seas for several days. We think that that's what caused the downwelling and pushed the blob offshore. And when we go back to the September 24th, after that wind period, now you can see, okay, it's been, for the most part, it's been mixed out here. But again, we had this, this dead loss here. And what we think happened is during this period of the strong northerlies and the high seas, the first thing it did was push the blob offshore and it, it probably moved through this area and unfortunately got into a couple of guys gear here. Um, and then finally, because of the high seas, the surface waters were mixed down and the oxygen was replenished, but it took a couple of days of that before it finally seems to have broken up and dispersed. So what we've really learned from our 2020 work um, is that uh, we are seeing a relatively large portion of Southern Cape Cod Bay experiencing low dissolved oxygen. And it seems to happen um, starting in mid-August and through September, and then definitely extending into October in some instances. Um, so now we have two years of 2019 and in 2020 where we have detected actually hypoxic conditions. Uh, so conditions that are not good for bottom animals to breathe. Um, the declining DO results in the formation of this three-dimensional hypoxic water mass or what I call the blob. Um, the depth of the picnicline, which is essentially water density. Um, and it's, it, it sort of comes into play with the temperature also but that density change is likely what's controlling its height and keeping it pushed down towards the bottom. So all of the dense water is, is concentrated on the bottom. Um, and that it, the blob moves. Um, so this movement seems to be driven by um, wind events that cause upwelling and downwelling conditions. Um, we do think that there is a, a period of high seas are required to mix the water column and replenish the oxygen on the bottom. Um, and we should maybe expect that um, when we get these strong northerlies, it's going to help, but the first thing it's going to do is move the blob into deeper waters. So, um, you know, when we see the winds pick up and when we see the northerlies and the sea state pick up, that's probably a good thing for getting rid of this. Um, but it doesn't mean that somebody's not still going to be affected by it until it moves, until it gets totally mixed out. 
Um, we think that 2020 was a little bit less severe of an event than 2019. We certainly had fewer reports of dead lobsters um, or dead anything in the traps. Uh, we only had one of the fleet's data loggers record um, a prolonged period of severe hypoxia. Um, so only one logger had about 48 hours worth of that severely hypoxic uh, death zone kind of um, readings. So that's, I guess, good. Um, we do think that um, it was, it appeared at least to me to be a little bit of a larger east-west extent this year than any of the data we had from 2019 indicated. So for example, we didn't have any reports or get any readings near the mouth of the canal or sort of to the north and west of the canal of low dissolved oxygen, but we definitely did this year. Um, so whether that was a timing thing on when we were out there, we certainly had a lot more data in 2020 than we did last year. Um, and that does make it a little bit hard to compare. So uh, these last three points are in italics because either, these are sort of my um, caveats. Um, because we had so much more data in 2020, it does make it a little bit hard to compare for 2019. Uh, we just didn't have as much data. Um, we're still missing data sort of in the middle of Cape Cod Bay. So the, the, the mid portion here, um, we would like to target that to um, getting some additional readings in that area for next year. Um, and then the study fleet does move their gear. Um, so the, the guys reacting to the data that they're seeing recorded on the deck box um, might be allowing them to move their gear and that might've actually helped alleviate some of the dead loss, which is what we hope will happen, um, but it does make it sometimes hard to interpret the data. So the next steps here, um, you know, we're thrilled with how this year went. Um, the success of the study fleet has been uh, phenomenal. The, ocean, the oceanographers at HUI are very excited about the quantity and quality of data that the study fleet is producing. Uh, so this has been great. We are planning to continue the fleet next season. Um, I'm hoping to expand it with maybe another one or two vessels, uh, specifically to try to cover the central portion of the bay. Uh, the collaborators at HUI will be working towards identifying what drives these declines in dissolved oxygen, um, trying to get at it in more detail and really a uh, better understanding of the process. And they'll be using the data from the fleet, from Center for Coastal Studies, and essentially anything else that they can dig up that, that is gonna be relevant. Um, DMF and then uh, Fish and Game staff are going to continue the development of these mapping applications. You know, eventually we want to get to a web app um, that will display current and recent conditions that the general public can access and, and look at to see what's going on. And we're trying to develop a smartphone application that will allow the fishermen sort of while they're on the water to look at, all right, what are the conditions right where this gear is or right where I want to put this trawl. Um, to help them sort of make informed decisions about where to place the gear. Um, and then we're going to add this catch log to the study fleet for next year. And what we'd like to ask them to do is to sort of fill out a log that will help us link what they're seeing in their catch to the environmental data that they're collecting. Again, to try to understand how the lobsters are reacting to these changing conditions. Um, so, you know, this has been a huge project. A ton of people have been involved with it, um, collaborators and uh, DMF staff um, all together. Uh, so please, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Open to the floor, ladies and gentlemen. Questions for Dr. Pugh. Mike Pierdnock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, there's some good details there. Uh, just a question and, or questions and some food for thought. Uh, your flow charts, which shows how the flow changes and you get into this isolated circular flow down in this neck of the woods where you end up getting the blob seems to correspond with uh, the blob being closest to shore in August, September, and then moves farther off. Uh, as far as the source is the source of this problem, looking at that, therefore the uh, septic systems and cesspools of Cape Cod that are not conforming, where you have thousands of people coming to the Cape and flushing and <laughs> resulting in the blob that then you see the result of that. Uh, I look at that and, and I look at that as a, as a suspected source. 
especially with the way that that flow remains isolated. One other thing I would recommend if it hasn't been looked at as I was involved with it in the 80s and now I'm dating myself is that when they designed the Boston Harbor sewage treatment plant and the outfall, they modeled the groundwater flow, well, excuse me, the surface water flow or the flow in Cape Cod Bay and throughout, and then assumed the distribution of the nutrients and so on uh, throughout the area. Your, your data appears to show that the flow regime has changed as a result of increased temperatures and so on. And I'm just curious to whether maybe that's another contributing source that then gets isolated in that area and results in the, the blob. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, so those are both good questions and good points. Um, the, so, you know, being downstream of any heavily populated coastline, so, you know, Boston up to, you know, Portsmouth, Portland, we've got three big cities north of us, and the water flow pattern for a large portion of the year brings stuff right down into Cape Cod Bay as almost like a catch basin. Um, so we think that it's a combination of that. Um, and then when you couple like rainfall events and stuff in the spring, um, you know, in 2019, one of the things we looked at was rainfall events and discharge in the Merrimack. Um, and it seemed high, if I remember correctly. So um, all of these events in the spring sort of bring stuff down um, for a good portion of the year. And then that change in the summer that sort of then isolates it. Um, so you've got all this stuff that's been coming downstream into Cape Cod Bay that now is going to get stuck there to some extent. And then, like you mentioned, um, you know, the, the Cape, and we know that there's a number of estuaries on the Cape that have eutrophication issues um, for a number of reasons, um, whether it be septic systems or, uh, you know, um, lawn fertilizer, et cetera. Everything that we as humans do, um, a lot of it ends up in the ocean. So um, all of these things are probably contributing to one way or the other. Um, and this is one of the things that the, um, the folks at, at Woods Hall are gonna take a good look at. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a lobster biologist. So some of this water quality stuff is a little outside my normal um, sphere of whatever. So I've been learning a lot about this, but that's really why we brought these collaborators on because this is their forte and they're gonna be able to look at the information. Um, and, and like you mentioned, you know, the, the older MWRA studies and whether or not the changing climate means that the, there's been changes to those flow patterns those are all things that the Huey folks are gonna be trying to look at to try to understand um, what's happened and why, why are we now seeing hypoxic conditions where we really haven't seen it in the past. No, th uh, thank you. One other thing to note that the Plymouth uh, nuclear power plant is no longer operational. So that discharge for years and that, that would also change locally the, the flow regime and, and what's going on in that area to add to it. Thank you. Yeah, very, very, very well done, thank you. Khalil? Khalil, you recognize. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I thought it was absolutely uh, awesome. Uh, it uh, just demonstrates, you know, the collaboration that can take place among different uh, uh, organizations. And, um, and it really just demonstrates the real science at work and how we can get results and some information uh, from that. I do feel that the data logging is gonna be an important part of your research. And I was wondering, are there, are there similar studies like this going on in other areas of the marine environment up, up and down the coast uh, or is yours unique? Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested about if anything like this is, a, is occurring in the Susquehanna Flats and in the areas where striped bass breed. Uh, I, I just felt your data was, was uh, really very interesting and um, shed, shed a lot of light on, on uh, what's going on in the environment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I don't know of any other studies anywhere near this scale um, that are happening. Um, you know, I think U.S. wide, the, um, there's some work being done in the, I think, Oregon area um, with some Dungeness boats that are using similar data loggers, um, uh, actually from the same developer even. Um, so they're starting to do some work out there specifically looking at dissolved oxygen. And I know that there's um, a, a fairly well-established monitoring program that keeps an eye on the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. 
But in terms of the East Coast of the United States, I'm not aware of any, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Thank you very much. Jared. Suki, I see your hand up. Yeah, yeah, Jared, thanks. Uh, yeah, Tracy, real good job. Uh, I know the guys enjoy working with you down there. They're very concerned about the future of this and hope is not gonna escalate and spread more into the Bay. So thanks for all your hard work. Thanks, Suki. Questions if, to Dr. Pugh. I'm not seeing any more questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. As always, your work is above board and the excellence is beyond belief. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll hear from you down the road at another commission meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, other business commission member comments. Start with Khalil. I'm all set, thank you. Suki. All set, Ray, no, nothing to say. Thank you, Bill Doyle. Uh, I, have, I have nothing, Ray, just learned an awful lot at this meeting, thank you. Bill Amaru. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I guess one quick thing I'd like to say that in my 48 years of being involved in fisheries and fisheries management for the last 40, this is the first time I've been to a committee meeting of some kind where we actually talked about liberalizing rather than constraining fishermen. And it's a great day uh, to think that we are actually at this point with all the hard work and sacrifices of fishermen around the whole New England area, that they're beginning to see improvements that are gonna reward them by allowing them to fish. And I'm very grateful to the division and the fishery service for all the progress we've made and all of the fishermen who've sacrificed. Thanks. Lou Williams. <clears throat> Lou. Not seeing anything from Lou, Lou Ray. Oh, here he is. Hey, is that Ray? Yeah. There you are, Ray. Lou. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> My phone died earlier there on the boat when I was tying up, but I got it back on here for the last hour. And I, uh, I just had, I, I just want to run, if you don't mind, something about that last presentation that might be just informative to help on that. Uh, if we got a minute, you got a minute, Lou. All right. Um, the last six years, six years ago, I knew some, they changed something on that MWRA because I fished that bay my whole life, Mass Bay. And uh, the uh, uh, they went from a so a chlorine gas to a uh, to a, um, um, a sodium chloride. I know that because my sister's brother-in-law worked there, and I saw him at a Christmas party four years ago. And I says, "Tom, what they do there? They changed that two years ago." So I started seeing less fish. I see the changes, and he said, "You're right. They changed it." So. My concern was, what is it affecting? Is it affecting the spawn or whatever, you know? And I, I, I but it's definitely affecting the fish. The dogfish, they show up, they leave. They've been doing it for, this was the sixth year. I didn't kill them that this summer. The guys that did said they didn't even show up this year. But what they've been doing since they changed that to sodium chloride is the dogs come in. I feel they don't like the water quality and they leave. And it used to be they'd be there all summer and they'd be part of our daily routine. So something's changing there. Now, something that's very bothersome is this year. I said, well, it didn't seem like it was affecting the, the lobsters. Well, the lobsters have been dropping off in that bay a little bit since the peak in 2015. And to me, this year, it dropped off a cliff. We're down probably 50% in our catch rate. But more disturbing to me was the small amount of uh, shorts in different year classes. I, I never saw so many empty traps in my life this year. I have real concern that whatever's going on with that outfall pipe is affecting the spawn for the fish and the lobsters because the lobsters, you're not gonna see it overnight. Fish will grow quicker and you'll, and you'll be able to see the, the, you know, less and less fish. But now this year, I'll tell you, 
I think my prediction is this, never mind the right whales, this racket's going to have a problem coming up because I didn't see the future in my traps this year, you know. So just something to think about. Um, you know, I've always had a problem with those outfall pipes, you know. But uh, anyhow, I don't want to take up too much time. It's a long meeting. So so that's uh, that's all I got to say. Thank you, Lou. Shelly Edmondson, Dr. Edmondson. Hi there. I've um, just really enjoyed all of this and I'm so impressed with all the work that goes behind it all from the DMF staff. Um, I'm just learning and absorbing and just want to thank everyone for all their work and time. I'm very impressed. Thank you, Dr. Edmondson. Tim Brady. Hi, um, just one quick one um, for, for Dr. Pugh. Um, great presentation. And um, I just, I, I typed something in here. We've had cyanobacteria blooms in the Billington Sea watershed, Harrington, Herring Pond watershed, and West Pond watersheds that all empty into Cape Cod Bay. And I happen to live on Little West Pond. And <clears throat> we have had a cyanobacteria bloom that lasted into November, I believe. Um, I, I'm not sure if we even, I think the sign is still up down on the pond down there. So the the blooms that we used to have midsummer are going later and later in the year. So I just wanted to throw that in and thank you everyone and have a nice holiday. Thank you, Tim. Michael, Pierre Knock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a quick ICAT update. Uh, I'm part of the US delegation. Uh, ICAT typically takes place uh, uh, two weeks in November at an off uh, or an overseas location in Europe or Middle East or so on. This year it's remote. We've had meetings from uh, October 15th. Uh, and I have one after this meeting uh, that are ongoing. ICAT is not over. We're still in the midst of decision making and um, uh, bluefin tuna and where that's going to end up with our Western Atlantic quota is still up in the air. Uh, the MAKO measures are status quo, uh, but the bluefin uh, situation or status uh, has the most significant impact on all of us, depending upon where it goes with a reduction or status quo or, or stock assessment. So um, I'm not sure when it's going to be over. I thought it'd be over two weeks ago, but we're still, it's still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I only have one comment and it's to the director. Uh, probably a year or two ago, we started a Massachusetts Coastal Seaport Survey. I believe we incorporated some students or people studying for their master's or doctorates at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I would like to see the update on that. Uh, there was, I think, grant money involved there. And I just like to see it on next month's agenda, so we can okay, get. Okay, really you got it. Hello. Yep, we'll do that next month, Ray. Thank you, Dan. Okay, that's it for commissioners' comments, member comments. So I'm going to open it up to the public. Who have you got in the queue, Jared? All right, members of the public, if you have any comments, you can raise your hand. I will uh, acknowledge you and provide speaking privileges. Um, and uh, Ray, you want to give them about two minutes considering the time? Yes. Okay. So if you have a comment, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, I'm going to move it back to the uh, chairman to adjourn. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Ray. So we're going to move back to you to adjourn. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Bill Doyle with a motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Shelley. Meeting adjourned. Meeting Thank adjourned. you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good holiday. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays.